And then you would go out for cocktails, yeah. right? And maybe a real English dinner. Yeah. You know, something like a Chinese or something yeah. like that. Good morning, I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. You're listening to the Two Mics on Talk Sport. The big question in the world of football today is this. Has Pep Guardiola lost the plot? He dropped two of his star players yesterday, had his captain sent off for the third time this season and acted like a man on the verge of a nervous breakdown in his post-match interview. Porky's very worried about Pep. I think he's just putting it on. Which is it? 08717 Also coming up on the show, it's Ask Porky Day as well, so if you need a problem solved, this is the place to get it sorted. Just tweet us at the Two Mics or find us on Facebook. And the subject of Hull might come up as well, uh, since I was brutally attacked on Twitter uh, by the local MP. You're listening to The Two Mics with me, Mike Graham, and Mike Parry on Talk Sport. This is Talk Sport. We are The Two Mics, and we're here all week in uh, for Jim White. And it's time to say a very, very good morning to Mr Mike Porky Parry, who struggled in despite the slings and mm. arrows of a terrible cold. Very good uh, morning to you, Mr Parry. And a very good morning to you, Mike. And you're right. Um, funny enough, I do notice this year... Almost everybody's got some sort of cough or, or sniffle yeah. or sneeze. Well, I've only like for that. a month, but it's, I think it's finally yeah. leaving me. I think it's yeah. I've finally been able to transfer it to you. I uh, I managed to avoid it by being clever in my travel arrangements. You Was know, right? travelling in my uh, rather executive car, executive or, car, yeah, or uh, or getting up very very early and getting on trains before anybody else does. Yeah. Unfortunately, this morning, you find one. Unfortunately, this morning I was immersed in the ranks of the great unwashed, and I don't wish to be rude to anybody. No, but, you uh, certainly don't. No, that's what I call the great unwashed. That's what I call a Can't train. You in first class. Uh, you can't, believe me, in trains these days. You, you, you'd get lynched if you're in first class for being uh, exclusive and, and uh, selective. Well, and you all wouldn't that want kind that. Of stuff. Snobbish, even. I, I got on a train this morning, uh, which I had to get on because, of, you know, I had things to do this morning before well, I came out. you had to come out. to work. You had to come to work, yeah. What do you mean you had things to do? Which, what train did you get on? Oh, I got on Why a train. Why are you so secretive about everything you no, do? No, I'm not. I got on a train at about 7.30 or something like that. 7.30? You know? Yeah, yeah. I, right. I, I would Which like gets to... you into London about, what, eight-ish? No, about ten past eight. But oh, I'd that's li- about eight-ish. Oh, is it? Yeah, OK, yeah. Uh, but I'd like to have got an earlier train, but I had, you know, responsibilities Did which you? I had to look after. Like you know? what? Well, I, you know, I'm not going into that. Our millions of listeners aren't interested. Well, what time did you get up? In the th- uh, about uh, f- 4.45. <laughs> mm. What's your problem? 4.45. Mm. So yeah. you're up for three hours before yes, you got on a train? Yes, 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 including feeding my ducks and, and the responsibilities oh, yeah. How I have. Very well indeed, yeah. thank you. I went the uh, the baseball bat and smashed the ice on the uh, pond so that they had water. Oh, I didn't know you had one. What? A baseball bat. Well, it's not a baseball bat. Did you keep bat. that for uh, terrorising your pet No, 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 not at all. In case they have cats or no, bikes or anything, you'll have to throw them out. It's actually a long stick. It mm. resembles an axe handle, but it's not really? an axe handle, if you see what we're I mean. We're supposed to be doing some axe throwing on well, We are, week. actually, yeah, we're going to get round to that. Yeah. Anyway, the point of my story is, the train I came in on this morning... And nobody wants to hear about <laughs> your train you came in on this morning. <laughs> it could you have know, been. Nobody cares. It's called rush hour. It Everybody c- who has to travel during rush I'll hour, tell which you what, most people, I have to put up with that every day. I thought I was in a suburb of Tokyo where they have they employ special people to boot uh, the uh, travellers onto the yeah, train. Don't yeah, they, they use it with a big brush, sort of big brush yeah, yeah, type thing. Yeah. Well, they know they literally sort of boot them and, and no, they use a big brush. Well, whatever, yeah, but to get them on. But it, it was a hideous journey. I'm not going to do that again. I'd rather hire my own train or something like that. To be honest, I don't think you're allowed to hire. I don't your think own you train. are. Um, but well, anyway, I came in on, on, on a rush out a tube train. You had to stand. It was uh, very busy. I mean, that's that a go. big problem. Well, it's go. fine. It's just it's what yeah. you have to put up with. It's what everybody has to put up with. I know. I shouldn't. Moaning. You shouldn't anyway, be moaning. Let's get on I to mean, things uh, Pep. could be worse. Now, I told you years ago when Pep suddenly decided he needed a break from Barcelona, yeah. where frankly he'd been gifted a team on a plate. Uh, a team of which he was part. He yeah. then went on to well, manage he helped and to build coach. that team as well, didn't of he? Of course he did. But it was all on a bit of a plate to him there. And then, of course, he decided to go elsewhere, went to Germany, and now he's come here. But any man who takes a sabbatical from his job because he says, I need a break, is not. A quality product. I don't agree at with the that. very, very highest end. I don't agree with that. I Sir Alex Ferguson would see, never have dreamed see. of well, saying. Sir Alex Ferguson was going to retire and then decided not to, <laughs> and he didn't um, because he realised he would miss it. But you can't take a year off and say I just need to regroup. Well, the minute you say I'm well, he taking didn't a year just off, need to regroup. He, I mean, he's a guy who maybe understands. <laughs> he pushed off to like, America where they yeah, weren't even playing football and, and, in learned, those days. and learned how to speak German. Well, that was one of the reasons he went there. You're going to cough all the way through. No, this. I'm not going to cough all the way through it. But and you do something about that. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, wearing a mask tomorrow. What I'm saying is, is that, uh, in my view, he is not as driven as people like Sir Alex Ferguson, as Jose Mourinho, 
as, um, well, I don't know, you know, people like Mr Ancelotti and all that who don't like taking time off, mm. who would prefer to be working all of the time. Well, yeah, like but Sam working, Allardyce, but, really. But, but, well, Sam, how about Sam Allardyce? He's already moaning and groaning about this, the, 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 you know, this complicated fixture list over Christmas well, and New Year. He's got to stand up for his own team. Well, hang on, but the fact is he hasn't had a job for a while. He's been off, so what's he looking worried about? I mean, if, he should, if he's playing football every second day or yes. every third day, yes. he should be happy he's making up for lost time. Yeah, but he's, he's talking been out about of a job the, since August. He's talking about the strain it puts on his players well, and, and, the, and the physical incursion. Yeah, He's calling for people to be sacked, which I think, given the circumstances under which he found himself in the summer, yes. uh, it's just slightly uh, disingenuous. Well, if I were you, I'd uh, curb your lip about um, about Mr Allardyce. Why is because, that? well, in two weeks' time, we're going to be doing our Saturday show from Crystal Palace, so? where Mr Allardyce so is the manager. So why would that make me change any, anything, any view that I might have of the world? Uh, because I don't want you to be offensive to a man who is basically part of the... Uh, oh, what? So you mean I should be buttering Sam Allardyce up because of, we're going to Crystal Palace? That's not of, how I operate. Part of the organisation, which no. is our host on that day. They're well, playing Everton, of course. If he now, refuses to speak to me, you can interview him on your own. Well, I'd be happy to because uh, Mr. Allardyce. And then and you I, could give him one of those soft interviews that you're so famous Mr. for. Allardyce, mm, Mr. Allardyce. Mr. Allardyce, how are you? And mm, I have isn't had. It's great uh, for you to be back in football. I've had mm, some very deep. Shall I see you in the boardroom afterwards? Mm. Some deep rooted conversations in the past. Now, you mentioned Everton there, and of course, no, I'm I didn't. very happy to mention Everton. I did not mention you ma- Everton. You did. You no, mentioned, I did. No, oh, you no. mentioned oh, Everton. Oh, I did. That's right. Sorry, I did yeah. not mention Everton. <laughs> I said we're playing Everton. Uh, Crystal Palace are playing Everton, right? Okay. So that's me mentioning it, but you nodding your head. Did you see that Martin Keown last night on Match of the Day was fulsome in his praise of Ross Barkley. Yeah, exactly. This said is what that Ross Barkley is finally running the game for Everton. Well, he kind of well, anyway. was, but I wasn't half pleased with our new young um, midfield player, Tom Davis. What about that young, uh, the young Mike Parry? What about him? Who? The young Mike Parry. What you know about? The guy looks exactly like you when you were young, except with slightly lighter coloured blonde hair. You're talking about Tom Davis? Yes, him, the one with the beard and the long hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. He looks like a young Mike Parry. You think so? That picture of you bringing Trudy out of the surf. Oh, that's, yes. That's yes. him. You think so? Yeah. That's right. Look how flattered you are. That's a compliment, yeah, indeed, yeah. So you don't get very but, many of those. Uh, I've completely put you off now, haven't no, I? No, not at all. Set um, you up on the back So foot. what I was about to say was that uh, bodes well for the future and uh, and also brilliant substitution. Old Anna Valencia brought on by Mr Cooman. Well, you could say that or you could say that he finally worked out that the team that he put out there in the first place was not doing anything t- at all, were not penetrating at all. I think you'll find Hampton. it's a question of trial and not error, but trial and improvement. Improvement. That's uh-huh. the way I see it. I see. And it seemed to work. Um, we won 3 nil. And I thought that uh, Lou, Lou, Lou Koku demonstrated exactly what a striker should do when a ball is put through for him. Don't take a touch. Don't take You're a second thought. You're talking about the third goal. The third goal. Yeah, you just see, whack it into the roof of the There are two kinds of strikers, though, aren't there? There are those that score important goals yes. and those that don't. And an awful lot of Lukaku's goals are not that important, you'd have They're to very say. important to Everton. No, they're not. The, yes, third they goal, the third goal was not as important as the one he should have scored in the first half. No, don't agree. Everton won 3-0. You yeah, can't possibly argue with a result like that. No, you can't possibly argue. What I'm saying to you is, is that the 3-0 yeah. win, yes. uh, the third goal is less important than if he'd scored the first goal. No, it's not. It's because it makes it a more comprehensive win and that boosts the um, you know, the confidence factor mm. and uh, all is well in the world. Yeah, all is not well in the world if you're just in Edinburgh. He's just been sacked as the manager of Gillingham, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, poor old Justin. So you don't even have any sympathy for a man being sacked at this time of the year. People say, oh, terrible to sack someone just before Christmas. You get a not much Bob fun to be sacked in the... Uh, what, well, from Gillingham, you won't? Well, you get something. It's, something. it's not in, it's not in the Jose Mourinho uh, area, is it? I'm just trying to figure out where Gillingham is. Is it in... It's in uh, Kent. It's in the Medway. Yes, right. It's a Medway town near I think Rochester. I've, I think I've been there. In fact, you I... think you've been... Didn't you used to have friends in Maidstone you used to go and see? Uh, you told me that once. That was quite a long time ago. Yeah, well, a long time since you had any friends. I, I think that I actually reported, uh, you know, officially as the reporter for uh, the Gillingham... Chester game. Was you? And travelled with Chester, the team, down to Germany. What do you mean when you were on the Chester Chronicle? When I was on the Chester Chronicle, yeah. yeah Did I'm you go sure. down the Hell's Horse and Cart? Uh, no, we went down on a train. Really? And it was very interesting, actually, because... Uh, oh, no, we haven't got time for this story. No, no, yeah, we had to go to London first, right? Yeah. Chester had just come into money because they'd sold their training pitch next to the ground <laughs> to a supermarket. How much for? 28 uh, quid? Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> but they had enough money to travel in uh, decent seats. I don't think it was well, first not class. third class. Well, that's third, third class, class, though, didn't they? Hey, you didn't have third class. Well, then. it's even better than that. They they, they had. Um, Seen the time. Chester, yeah, yeah. Let me just finish. Chester had enough money to travel in decent seats. Mm. Bottom was, I had to 
go and find the loo. So I got up and I went through the... In those days, you had goods wagons, OK, the guards wagon, and crew, because we'd passed through crew, yeah. who were also playing in the south of England, were sitting in the guards wagon, hmm. the crew team. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All of them were sitting on boxes in the guards wagon. Hmm. I think that's where crew started. That's where crew have always been. That's where crew will yeah. always be. Are you going to upset another city today? No, no, uh, no. Dom no. says this, Porky walking around at 4.30am in pitch black, <laughs> smacking at the ice, sounds like something from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag plank. It that's, does rather. That's a bit hard. Now, uh, we've got to get back, get back to talking about Pep Guardiola. I think Pep Guardiola is putting it on to take uh, no. all the attention away from his team in the same way that Alex Ferguson used to do, in the same way that Jose Mourinho used to do. But we need to know from you uh, whether you agree with Mr. Parry yes. uh, that Pep Guardiola has actually lost the plot I completely. think he's lost the plot. I uh, thought he's a very disturbed man. I saw three separate interviews after the game, mm, you know, last night so did and, everybody one, else. and one this morning. And the way that he was using his fingers to pinch his face and rub his nose and, 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 and his his rudeness and arrogance yeah. towards the interviewers are only trying to do their job. Yeah. You know, why did I talk? Well, we're going to talk to Don McGuinness, who's exactly. a talk sports man who had the same experience exactly. with him, and he'll talk us through precisely how Pep was behaving. Yeah. Uh, we want to hear from you, though. 08717 Has Pep Guardiola lost the plot? Let's hear his interview with Don McGuinness from Talk Sport, which took place also after the game. Well, Pep, how do you sum up that? It's a, a big three points for you. Are you pleased with the overall performance? Yeah, it was good. We're so happy. It was very hard for you as well with Fernandinho sending off. Firstly, any, any problems with that decision from the referee? No, as to a referee. You made changes, I suppose you had to, just to spark the team. Uh, and Aguero, Silva coming on, it did make a difference. And that's some finish from Aguero. Yeah, amazing, brilliant. I suppose it's something you would expect from a player of his, his quality, outstanding ability. We spent, we, 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 we were seven, seven uh, games without him. Without Nolito to make absolutely anything, and now for Fernandinho for many many times, I know what's going on here. I know exactly what happened. Now again, we, we, with with the keeper, with the, the goal for Burnley, is there any problem there? I mean, obviously there's a lot of his fault. His fault, yeah. In all around the world, his fault. Maybe here not, but his fault. When the touch of goalkeeper in the box, his fault. And Stekelenburg, the game Everton in the first in the beginning of the season, it was fault. He doesn't sound a happy man, does he? No, he doesn't. Let's actually. talk to Dom and find mm. out what he made of it all. Dom, a very good morning to you. Morning to you, lads. Uh, he was a bit agitated. Yeah. That's certainly the case. I mean, um, the thing was as well, when he came to do that interview with me, I, mm. I didn't know he'd done the TV interviews at that point because mm. we're in a... It, there's, it's all changed at City. They're doing some work and we're in a different area now. The tunnel's kind of changed and I, I didn't see him going to the TV interviews and I had no idea mm. that, he'd, that he'd done those frosty interviews with TV. So when he came to us straight mm. away... Um, you know, obviously I didn't know what to expect because obviously 10-man City getting three points, I, I thought he'd just be pleased to get yeah. over the line with that. But obviously, uh, you know, I think that he had a plan that he wanted to do the interviews the way he did, obviously. Mm. I mean, they're pretty much all the same and his press conference with the written press afterwards was pretty much again the same. He was a bit tetchy. Uh, and I, I think, you know, you, there's plenty of theories as to why he might be reacting like that and why he, he thinks the world's against him a little bit. And is he trying to create a siege mentality? Is, is, is he trying to deflect attention away from the players? Is he trying to say everyone's against City and, and in doing that in doing that that might be you know obviously something that can help the team progress get the fans on board I mean obviously the fans are a bit split I think as well right. a lot well, of I noticed, fans... well I noticed yesterday sorry to interrupt you that, I mean mm. I mean, well, before the, the post-match kind of trauma that everybody had to go through watching him trying to you know do modest loving answers mm. he seemed when he came out for the second half he was trying to rouse the crowd he didn't look like he was happy with the crowd either it was a little bit flat but you know you, you can say that for every ground in the country can't you you know the, 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 they are pretty flat in the Premier League now most grounds a lot of the time and it, it was one of those games I think that obviously during holiday seasons as well you can often get that kind of reaction from the crowd that you know it, it's kind of the end of the festive season and it, it's just a, you know there have been a lot of games and, and it can be a little bit like that and it, it was a flat atmosphere yesterday but I think that you know a lot a lot of the City fans you know will, will have a go at the media for trying to prod Pep in, in that way they'll see it that way they'll defend the manager some I know have said that you know what, what's he doing mm. they don't understand really well, that, that, Dom to be honest I think it was a bit further than him just Stowe building this siege mentality. Mm. I mean, there were some very clear signs last night that he might be might be trying to give the indication and the signals to everybody that I don't actually like.
like being here. You know, I mean, it's talking about premature uh, retirement, mm. being absolutely and utterly rude to uh, three or four different interviewers, yourself included, people he's going to have to work with for years to come if he stays around, and actually his general attitude to simple questions about his ability to run a team. And this all goes back to what I think I've said to you before, Dom. A man who takes a sabbatical from the highest level of his profession, you know, as a coach in football, can't then come back and apply the same sort of, you know, um, for forensic detail and attention to the job, I think he's finished. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think he will well, never I mean, be. I mean, well, he will never be the same man he was Carlo, at By the way, Carlo Ancelotti well, took a year off between uh, going from Real Madrid to Bayern Munich. But he knew he was going to Bayern well, Munich. Pep took years off when he didn't know where he was well, going no, next. It took a year off. I think he learned German, didn't he? I think he had a good idea where he was he, going. He knew exactly where he was so, going. He went to learn yeah. German. Yeah. He, the, See, Porky's trying to make out this guy's a man on the edge of a nervous breakdown. I'm saying no, he's actually doing it. No, you're putting words in my mouth. I'm saying he's doing it to protect his players and he's trying to create, as you say, some kind of siege mentality. I think there's look, look there are frustrations. I think he's found a lot about English football frustrating. I think he's found the fact that he got annoyed with lots of questions about the Premier League, you know, and, and this great product and how hard it's going to be for him. I think those kind of questions annoyed him from the off. It's like, uh, you know, and some might say, oh, he's arrogant because he thinks he's above all this and blah, mm. blah, blah. I think he just got a little bit fed up talking about how tough the Premier League is. You know, I think he's got a lot of confidence in his own ability and then mm. he's going to get things right. And that's why questions like that have agitated him. And that's why you can see he's animated animated, he's agitated a lot of the time with the press. Look, personally, I don't care. if It can be rude to me all day. No big deal. We're big boys and we, we can deal with that. I don't care. It's not, it's not good behaviour. Well, you know. that, that's, that's, that's another debate. In terms of, you know, well, obviously... Well, Dom says in terms he doesn't care if he's rude to him. Well, <laughs> I, I, don't think that, I don't think that matters yeah, but, d- but Dom should value himself more than that. You should have more <laughs> self-worth, yeah. Dom. No, don't worry. I'm happy with myself, mate. It's okay. fine. All I'm saying is, in, in you know, the, the emotion of a game, and he's very emotional, very intense, very animated. If that's the way he has to deal with it because he thinks that's the best best way to deal with that situation and, and inspire his troops and get the fans on board, then fine. As I say, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. You can argue that it's, it's rude or arrogant or whatever. I, I've no real problem with that. I've dealt with him many times since he arrived. And, and you know, overall, no, not an issue. I think yesterday, certain things, obviously what he perceived to be the foul on Bravo that wasn't, obviously Ben Mead had already scored, but he maybe hadn't had the, the luxury of having a, a good look at that incident mm. again. So obviously that's, this, that's one of the things that he was going on about. Yeah. He, he, he sounded also, like he was saying fault, but he yeah. meant fouled. But he was also... He was also yeah. hinting in some of the TV stuff that he mm. did um, that, you know, there were different rules and regulations yeah. as for red cards in this country, mm. hinting, I presume, that he didn't think Fernandini should have got a red card. Well, and he said shouldn't... Because an awful lot of his players have been red carded. I mean, for a guy who talks about possession Fernandinho football... Fernandinho, three times in six yeah, games. Three, but, I mean, he's had about another five. I mean, Aguero's been red carded twice. I mean, for a guy who mm. uh, values what he calls possession football, yes. you know, presumably these guys are getting red carded for not having the ball. Well, yeah, that's City's seventh red card of the season. It's twice as many as any other Premier League side. Yeah. So, that, you know, that, that, that is a, a cold light of day fact. And obviously, Fernandinho, you know, that's twice in, in a month and three, three times mm. in six weeks. And, and again, he's going to be missing for a long time. Now, I do think that, you know, Pep obviously feels decisions are not going his way. Now, he didn't want to get involved in talking about the referee. Didn't, uh, that was fairly clear. That's why mm. he was throwing the questions at us and being monosyllabic, if you like. So, you know, but I think that there's a lot of things that he's had to... That, that obviously, the, the Liverpool defeat has bothered him. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Mm. He's had questions asked about Sergio Aguero, who obviously didn't start yesterday. Mm. He said that he was never going to start yesterday because he's just come back from a four-game ban. He played 90 minutes at Liverpool and he was never going to start. So, fair enough. You can see maybe that was always the case and him and Silva coming on. And But obviously, the, 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 you know, the, there's been questions, you know, is there an issue with him and Aguero who scored 17 goals now? You know, Gabriel Jesus is, is arriving at the club today. Mm-hmm. You know, this new signing from Palmeiras, a striker as well. So, that, that adds a, a little intrigue to that situation. So, you know, is Pep dealing with, with issues with players and, and all these questions yeah. that managers get asked and that sure. managers do have to deal with? So, and also I think he's having, got a lot having, of his play. Yeah, and he's having, and, he's having, and he's having to deal with them in a, in a, in a, in a foreign environment, whether, we, mm. whether he likes it or not. And, and I think there is something about... I mean, we've heard Guillaume Balaguer on this station many times saying, you know, it's a complete myth that the Premier League is harder than La Liga. And I think there are people uh, who have been involved in La Liga, like Pep, who mm. think that that's true. Yeah. And, and that the Brits are way too pompous about the fact that the Premier League is the best league in the world. And he's irritated that he's not on top of it because actually he's never been really anywhere like fifth before when he's when he's been in charge of a team. Yeah, but he? that's that's why he's being found out, isn't he, Dom? He's always well, had I'm almost no 
gone. <laughs> he's had almost monopolistic control of clubs in his previous two jobs. Barcelona in particular, at the height of their powers historically, and of course Bayern Munich don't have any opposition in Germany. Now he's finding it that the heat in the kitchen is in fact intensely hot in this country. Yeah, but let's get it right as well. If you look at the flip side of that, he's not at Bayern Munich. He doesn't have the, the, that ready-made team that Munich had. He's not at Barcelona where he'd been since he was a child and he knew the place. And that's why he's the biggest, no, that's yeah, why the yeah. highest paid been, coach in the world to build a team exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly the point. He's been at Manchester City for six months. He's had one transfer window. The second transfer window is happening now. So if you are going to play devil's advocate on this one in terms of if you want to back Pep all day, you can say he's just arrived. There's lots to do. He said at the very start as well, mm. if, you know, he did say at the very start, he expected it to be difficult and it would take a long time for him to well, get everything. You shouldn't get so stroppy he, about it well, when he <laughs> finds it is hard well, work. That, again, that's a different thing. His, his manner, the way he deals with all this, that's a different question. But in terms of the job he's doing and where City are and the position they are in the Premier League, hardly disastrous, two off Liverpool. The Champions League knockout stage is Monaco. I fancy Manchester City strongly in that tournament. I do. You know, it's hardly a crisis, no. is it? The FA Cup's about to start. They've got West Ham away at the weekend. You know, you know all right, it isn't... But I think that there was huge expectation, and, and there should be huge mm. expectation on Pep Guardiola con- coming to England. But I, I think that anyone that thought he's going to come in and, and, and absolutely roll over everybody was mistaken. All I right, think Tom, he's a victim of his own success we as well. Time. Remember, I need to ask you one final question because it's all about the media for a lot of Manchester City fans as well. I mean, I've seen tweets uh, overnight about Sir Alex Ferguson who hmm. refused to answer questions yeah. uh, after, <laughs> yeah. after... the BBC after, for about yeah, seven years. Years. Well, refused to go on the BBC altogether, but yeah. walked out uh, on a Match of the Day interview, which was never then shown on TV. Uh, uh, Jose Mourinho, who, of course, has famously been very tetchy after games. Klopp was quite tetchy. I mean, are people picking on Guardiola more than they are on anyone else? I think that there is a little bit of that because it is Guardiola from Barcelona, yeah. from Bayern Munich. And, you know, he's still a young guy. And I think he's come in with this incredible reputation as the best coach in the world. Mm. And, and I, I think there is a, a tiny little bit of, you know, it's a bit unfair sometimes that jumping on things. Let's let's remember as well, he's slightly a victim of his own success. Ten straight wins to start the season. Mm. So everyone thought, oh, he's cracked it straight away, this fella. You know, and also as well, this is a guy that's come to England and, and he's done every single interview in English. Now, again, they don't all do that when they, when they come to England and we, we all knew that he could speak English, but sometimes little bits and pieces are lost in translation. Just like yesterday, we could have jumped on the fact he kept talking about fault mm-hmm. when we know now he meant foul. Right, yeah. You know, little things can be lost, so you've got to give him the benefit of the doubt sometimes yes. on some of the little bits and pieces that he does with the media. I do think think, though, you know, short memory is because we all sat in front of Sir Alex Ferguson. That was a far more terrifying experience than anything Pep Guardiola can throw at you. So, sure. you know, let, let's get it right. And there might be a touch of xenophobia uh, and, and that's unfair and oh, it's not there's right. there's no xenophobia. I mean, Tom, he's listen, creating any crisis at City time, himself. Yeah. You're creating a crisis on the show don't, by don't not keeping it to certain time. time frames. <laughs> Dom, thank you very much indeed. All the best. Uh, give uh, Pep Guardiola our love next time you talk to him. <laughs> uh, we'll be talking more about Pep Guardiola. I want to hear from you. Is he faking it? Is he actually as uh, wound up as he appears to be? Uh, or is he just trying to deflect from the uh, inadequacies of the team, his team selection, uh, and the fact that keep, people keep getting sent off uh, loads and loads of times? 08717 We'll take calls next. Uh, just before we do that, here's where Chris, the happy Charlton fan, who says to, to me, Mr. Parry's one to talk of offending Crystal Palace, remind him of his one effort at offending him uh, at that, uh, that particular club with a certain Mr. Brazil. Which, of course, is the old story of you getting thrown out of there. Well, I mean, it, 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 was, Simon Jordan. it was so badly um, misinterpreted, you know, the uh, the actions of Mr Brazil and I that night, yes. that it's not worth talking about, frankly. Nobody's mm. ever got down to the, you know, the fact that Mr Brazil and I were our best behaviour and, and, and brashly and uh, badly bullied by a collection <laughs> of men in uh, in black leather coats. Yeah, I see. James yeah. Impressor said, it's clear that both Pep and Mourinho are immature and rely on sulky and passive-aggressive behaviours when things don't go their way. Well, what about Sir Alex? Ferguson, mm. you know, he didn't speak to the BBC for for what years? Was yeah, but it? he di- but he didn't come out after a game and petulantly, you know, sulk and and shout and hey, scream and and, and he, you know, he was petulant all the time. With moan people. and whinge. No, he wasn't. He, was petul- he, wasn't. he wouldn't answer questions. He would throw he's, people he's, out of press conference. He, he, he didn't to, like the questions. He said to the BBC, "I I didn't like something you'd done. It involved no, members but of I'm my not, family. I'm not talking. Yeah, you're but fine. That, but that wasn't all though. What I'm yeah. saying is, is that he would have press conferences where he would kick people out of them because he didn't like the way they asked the question. When I was the supremo at the press association. You were never um, supreme. Man. Yeah, I certainly was. Rubbish. And uh, our lad once he uh, he'd written something which had offended to Alex. So Sir Alex uh, offered. A, he said, "I'm not going to throw you out." He said, "But uh, you can have your say first, and then I want you to leave." 
So he made him stand up in front of everybody yeah. else and answer three, ask three questions, right. uh, and then dismissed him from the room. So yeah. he can be, he could be quite. Uh, well, we've, we've heard as well this morning on the sports breakfast, Mr. Brazil yes. and Mr. Quinn. Yes. Uh, there was one of the journos on there talking about how uh, Pep Guardiola asked a particular journalist to look him in the eye yes. while he was talking to him. Look me in well, the eye. in fact, he was taking notes. Anyway, let's get some views because yeah. Stephen's a Manchester City fan. I'd love to know what he thinks. Stephen, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, guys. Yeah, good morning. Are you one of those who's happy with Mr Guardiola, or what do you think of his uh, behaviour? Well, I just want to start off by saying Happy New Year, guys. Happy Happy New Year to you, man. Yeah, thank you. Porky Uh, hates it when you say Happy New Year after the 1st of January, by the way. Yeah, it's unnecessary. But anyway, let's get on with it, Steve. Yeah, let's get on with it. Well, let's start off by by saying I do respect Pep Guardiola, and I do want him to do well at our club, obviously. You know, I love Manchester City. I'm a season ticket holder. However... I am actually a bit worried about how unhinged he seems at the moment and how mm. his uh, team selection, his squad selection, seems all over the place. Yes. He seems to like, pick the same players. Um, I'm a bit worried about our goalkeeper. I think he, he just seems weak. He doesn't seem like he can stress, he can dive. He doesn't seem like a good shot stopper. Um, you so would yeah, worry, but you would worry about letting go of Joe Hart for all of the criticism that, uh, that, that he's had to put mm. up with to put this guy in. Yeah. I mean, the jump, he was not impeded the first jump he made, was he? No, he wasn't impeded. He, he, he seems to take a lot of risks and cause a lot of goals. Yeah. If you look at all, a lot of our goals, they've all, they've all really been caused by his mistake. The mm. fact just doesn't seem to want to own up to the fact. And what I worry about is, but is that this guy, this Pep Guardiola, is that arrogant? And he has a little bit of contempt, I think, for English football. Mm. I don't, I can't see him putting his hands up and saying, yeah, I was wrong about this goalkeeper, and, and you know, maybe get another goalkeeper in, or even put mm. Willie Cal- Calabrero in. What do you I make of him trying to whip arrogant. up the crowd, Steve? Because that was part of his act last night, you know, furiously well, waving well. at the crowd. Yeah, and it was like an aggressive manner. It wasn't in like come on, guys. Oh yeah, it was like he was. It was like it was like he was blaming like he, the crowd exactly, yeah. for not getting behind the team. Yeah, make more yeah. noise because the team will play better. Yeah, I, I found I found I found it a bit weird the way he did that. If he'd have done it in a, in a style where he was like asking us to nicely to get to, to cheer on the crowd, and fair yeah. enough, but it was like in an aggressive way, just like I'm it was. And it was. I, I'm a little bit worried about it to be honest with you. Obviously, I, I hope he turns it around. I, I do have. Respect and I do have faith in him, yeah, but at yeah. the moment, it's looking it's looking a little bit worrying the way. Right, do you think? Steve, do you think there's? A, do you think there's any symbolism, Stephen, in the fact that they're digging up the Manchester City tunnel at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I seen his, I seen his uh, interview that he did with NBC, the American show, yeah. and he was talking about playing on golf courses and retiring. Yeah. And, and for a manager who's supposed to be here for three years, and I totally to be, agree with you. you know, build, totally build agree. Team. He should Why never have taken about... that sabbatical. It gave him the exactly. taste of life without the pressure. It's, I don't I don't know what he's playing at, but it's almost if he's saying, you know, you won't see me again, I'll be on the golf course with yeah. all my money. And it's, I think it's a little bit disrespectful. Yeah, yeah I do. You do, you do wonder if he's, if he's laying the ground. Stephen, thanks for your call. You do wonder if he's laying yes. the ground for sort of, you know, the exit. You, you've chased me out. That's you right, know, the yeah. press have chased yeah. me out. Yeah. You know, the fans have chased Ooh. me out. You know, the board have chased me out. They're even yes. digging up the tunnel uh, when I'm supposed to be in charge of the team. Let's talk to Chris, uh, who's a Bolton fan. Chris, very good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah very, very well, well indeed. Happy New Year to you. Yeah, happy new year to you guys. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Let's yeah. get on with yeah, it. Yeah, listen shall to we? the disdain mm, in Porky's mm. voice when you wish him something nice. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> what do you reckon about Mr. Guardiola? I think the guy is an absolute genius because when you think about that game at the weekend, his goalkeeper that he's brought in is an absolute shambles. He's he a pudding. He's had a midfielder that's been sent off for the third game in, in six. whatever it is. Seven, six. Six no, he's captain. Games. He's the captain. Yeah. And he's, and yeah. he's the captain of the side. So what better way to deflect attention away from your players and away from the situation than throw hissy fits in all your uh, your press conferences? It puts the attention back on him. It takes the, the, the spotlight off his players. And it means they can go in and fair enough, they'll probably criticise their own sort of performance and look at it from, you know, sort of a video, but we'll do it privately without sort of all the media attention, without being on the back pages, and they'll move on from it. Yeah. What we should be talking about instead of these Guardiola hissy fits is how horrible this goalkeeper is mm. and how he's let England's number one go mm. without even bothering to try and coach him a new style, which is the essence of why he's got rid of him. Mm. Um, and he's brought in this utter lemon who, who is just... Yeah. Uh, I, I, he's as bad a goalkeeper as I think City have had yeah. in the last what, 
however many, what, 20 years? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris, now I would, I, would tend, I would tend to go along with your theory about him sort of uh, trying to, to deflect attention away from the team. However, it's, I don't think it's right to say that he's in control of his own kind of emotions at all times because he's clearly not. And when we heard after the Liverpool game uh, that he was waving his arms around and, and, and loosening his tie and being very agitated uh, outside of the dressing room because he doesn't understand why his players are not as good as Liverpool's at just, you know, you know, pie press or whatever it is that he wants them to do. And he's, and he's you know, like Mike said, his behaviour mm. in front of the fans yesterday uh, didn't look as if it was, uh, it was entirely just concocted. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. So he's clearly not as happy as he would like to be, despite what he says. No, I dare say he isn't. But then again, when you're not coaching Lionel Messi every week, I'm sure you're not going to be that happy, mm. are you, when considering what he's what he's had in the past? You know, I mean, what, he's had two of the greatest clubs in Europe. He was always going to find it tough in the first year because the majority of the guys that he's brought in aren't his players. Yeah, but Chris, Chris you're, you're a, why are you taking such an interest in this? You're a Bolton fan. I mean, don't you have your own problems yeah. at Bolton? I've just listened to that many national phone-ins over the last sort of day or two. Yes. Um, and I, and I, I like me football in general, you know, obviously. With, How do you with know if you're being... a Bolton fan? How, Sorry, why, that why are you being so rude to him? Because why are you being so interest, rude to Chris? Every, everybody takes an interest in football. Don't, you know, don't matter what level it is, whether yes. it's whether it's Premier League, you know, especially mm. when you're a supporter of a club down the lower leagues, you can pay attention to, to the Premier League as well as your yeah. own team. It's, it's everywhere. So Yeah, but you, you know, should be more like, concerned about your team getting back into the Premier League, you know what I mean? Well, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying I'm concerned about it. Like I say, it's just... Yeah, you know, well, why I, are you I like wasting so much time it. on another why, club? Why I just don't understand a, why that. Why are you giving such a hard time? Well, because, you know, I always worry about my so team. Rude. No, no, I don't care about other teams. I care only about my own team. So I, I suspect, Chris, that... You, you've got a sort of agenda here, you know what I mean? Did, no, no, did you, I, I did you once about, want to be a City fan and they kind of rejected you? Are you, saying, are you saying he's really no, Man United fan? Some, 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 some people can, can go, don't don't have to be, you know, ultra-fanatical about just one club. I love yeah. football. Yeah. See, Chris, you know I'm exactly I mean? like you. Yeah. I'm exactly like you. People don't no, understand. No, you're exactly like nobody. No. You don't support anybody. Well, because that means I can be completely and utterly, you know, no, neutral. No. I can be completely and, and utterly that... without bias. I can look into a subject and no. give you the truth about it. You haven't got it, a commitment which you, to anything because you, you can't commit. Which you can't do. You're the one that can't commit. Yeah, you can't rubbish. even, you haven't even been married. Rubbish. You plank. No, no, nor divorced, yeah. nor abandoned my children. You haven't got any children. No, no, that's why I didn't abandon them. Yeah. Chris, you thank did. you very much indeed for your call, mate. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on Pep Guardiola, but we'll also be keeping an eye on Mike Dean because Scott says this. Mm. Uh, are we going to have a half hour section on that joke of a ref Mike Dean boys he just well, wants I'm, I'm to be that. the centre of every game you can't talk about referees like that Why referees not? deserve the utmost respect because they do the hardest they job in football they deserve respect if they earn it yeah right yeah yeah sure but I mean you know refer- referees have interpretations you told Alan Brazil that you thought he got it wrong on that uh, uh, Phil Jones I, I, uh, I situation well, I how did. do you get respect for getting it wrong but I'm certainly not going to insult him for it I mean referees make mistakes well, you just insulted a guy that rang into the show because he was from Bolton yeah, but he was claiming to be a Bolton fan. He's concerned about Manchester City. That's pathetic because that's like no, a, that's like a Tranmere fan ringing in. So, oh, I'm very worried about Liverpool or Everton. Worry about your own club, pal. That's what you're brought up to do. And actually, you're wasting a lot of mental and uh, and physical energy on on Manchester City's um, problems. I just don't understand that no, at really. all. What a you know what a what a I don't know. What a, a planet from Zog type guy he is. A planet from Zog yeah. type guy. Yeah. Is that the best you can come up with? Yes. A man who spent his entire life working mm-hmm. with words. What? You're a planet from Zog type guy. <laughs> I think right, you've been overdosing yeah. on the old Lem sip this morning. <laughs> no, I haven't, no. Uh, how about this from uh, a mm. Trevor in Newt Nabbert? He says, yeah. What's the difference between taking a sabbatical and doing a runner and going into hiding for 12 months? I think that was the reaction to winning nothing. Um, is he talking about uh, Pep being worse than just taking the sabbatical? He's I don't saying, know. He's saying he ran I don't know what he means. Because he couldn't win the Champions League at uh, Bayern Munich. I don't know. Darren says... Or, I think or Pep... maybe maybe he'd failed at uh, Barcelona before yeah. he went to Bayern Munich. Yeah. I, I think Pep just doesn't know how to deal with not getting his own way. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, says, think that's uh, a, I think that's a good point. Says I Darren. A good point, and yeah. I think as well what I said earlier, that you know mm. it's all very well when you're having a bad season at Barcelona, you're second, maybe third yeah. at the worst. Yeah. Bayern Munich, you're having a bad season, you're maybe yeah. second, uh, 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 not never third. Yes. But, you know, he's never been fifth in any league. That he's been in well, he is now, and this is this is why I say well, to not you. At the moment, he's not. I think I mean, he's he becoming been. a little bit unbalanced about the position in which he finds himself. I, th- I think he's not happy. It's um, the emperor's clothes, isn't it? It's all it? about the emperor's clothes, isn't it? You know, I mean, the emperor's he, new clothes. Yeah, mean? yeah. I mean, he feels naked in the chamber, falling anything below second place in a table. That's obvious, and yeah. he's never been there before. Mm. And he and and he's finding it difficult to adjust to that sort of position. Yeah, we're trying to get hold of Carl Palmer, MP, by the way, uh, who's Carl uh, Turner, uh, Carl Turner, sorry, yeah. uh, MP, uh, who is of course um, uh, MP for Hull. Yes, uh, has been MP for Hull for, since two thousand and ten. Yes, uh, in amongst the various tweets that he sent out about how happy he was that Hull was yes. a city of culture. That's right. Uh, he attacked the whole Daily Mail. He did. Uh, 
thinking that it was owned by the London Daily Mail. Well, he thought the whole Daily Mail was a version of the London's Daily Mail, yeah. which he describes as a right-wing rag, yes. which I think is very unfortunate when any MP takes sides on the national press, yeah. which is under attack at the yes, moment, exactly, uh, and trying to be shackled by those who'd want to quieten it. S- shockingly, though, it turns out that the whole Daily Mail is not owned by the Daily Mail. No. In fact, it's owned by the Daily Mirror. It's owned by the Daily Mirror, who are the biggest supporters of yeah. the party that uh, Mr Turner represents in the How Commons, Labour. How is it possible Labour. that for seven years he's been know. an MP for Hull and not known who owns the local paper? It, it is astonishing. When mm. I worked on local papers, the local MP was in touch every week yeah. and would dine with the editor yes. and would actually dine with the board of the yeah. paper to make sure that all was well. Yeah. And knew very, very instinctively what the political background to the paper was all about. Exactly. Mr Turner, who's a Labour MP, didn't even know that the paper is funded, backed and run by a Labour-supporting media giant. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, this is a guy also who yesterday, in his defence of Hull, uh, called me a prat. Oh, it's a bit harsh. I mean, that's not very parliamentary language, is it's it? It's not at all. Do you know how much this guy claimed in expenses last year? You've got to tell me. Uh, upwards of uh, nearly £200,000. £200,000 in expenses alone? Yeah, that's on top, on top of his, his salary. £65,000 And salary. did you point out one particular item of expenditure that he'd uh, found necessary to claim for? Well, what I found was that hmm. from 2010, yes. uh, when he claimed £11,807 for his accommodation allowance, yes. that seems to have gone up uh, hmm. last year to 19939 so an increase of nearly 50%, or nearly 100%, I should say mm, exactly on uh, on what he was paying. So I don't know whether he's moved into more palatial headquarters in London, I, I but we're trying know. to get him on the show. We'd love yeah. to hear from him. We'd yes, love to please. know why he, he thinks it's necessary to call a taxpayer who funds his very lavish lifestyle yeah. a prat, a prat on Twitter. He's referring to you, of course. He was. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't altogether disagree, but. No, but that's not for him to say. No, it's Thank not. Thank you very much for your support. You know who we got coming on later on the show? It's fantastic. Michael Van Gerwen. Michael Van Gerwen. The, yeah. the, he, do you know he's won 26 competitions fantastic. in the last 12 months? Very exciting and, finale and the first, last night, The first one of 2017, which of course yeah. is the World Championship. It'd be fantastic yeah. to talk to him. What and a he's ball. chosen to come on this show. He, he's chosen to come on this he show. He's a big fan of yours. He, well, uh, we I have not only had... rude to him like you were to that Bolton fan. No, we've had an association in the past. I was once going into an event where he was going to throw well, a dart and an apple on my head. We'll have to ask him about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Maybe we can get him in to do it again. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I, I, I had to wear, um, like, safety specs, you know, like those uh, plastic things, you know what I mean? Well, that wouldn't help you if it's stuck in your forehead, would well, it? Well, he was never going to miss anyway, but in the end, it was called off, and um, I'm not even sure if he knew what he, either he was supposed to do it, but anyway. Yeah, as you anyway, say, lots of people are uh, ganging up on you against yeah. uh, against uh, your behaviour to that Bolton guy. John says, yeah. well done, Chris the Bolton fan, great call. Yeah. Mike Parry's not yeah. a disgrace. No, I don't think so. Uh, and Maria says, Mike Parry, no need yes. to be rude to that Bolton yes. fan, it's a sports radio show, mm. he can discuss discuss football in general, uh, it's a discussion. I have to be fair, yeah, that, uh, uh, it is yeah. rather ironic that you spent yeah. the previous call talking to yes. Don McGuinness about how rude Pep Guardiola was to journalists. Well, I, and I, a new unload on poor old Chris the well, Bolton Well, fan. hang on, there's one here which says, uh, MG, was Porky's New Year's resolution to be more nasty to callers? <laughs> and you sound like it's Red Bull overdose all over again. No, yeah. it's nothing like that at all. No, By the way, you're on the Lem sip now, aren't you? I'm on the Lem sip. By the way, as we're talking Manchester City, yes. of course, Manchester City's biggest fan mm. and one of my great correspondence mates yes. can join in if he wants. You know what we're talking about here. We're talking about Liam Gallagher. We are talking about Liam. Yeah. Uh, Liam uh, is not a great friend of yours. Well, he's called me a few... Uh, he's called you many, many names, most of which we can't repeat few, on here. A uh, few things in the past. Yeah. But, uh, Liam, you want to speak but about... But a crap your Kenny pl- Rogers is probably my favourite. It's the only one I can, we can well, say. That's the only one you can say. The rest mm. were, we're not saying. But now, uh, we're not going to talk about Hull all day. We would like the local MP, Carl Turner. Carl Turner, yeah. For Hull East. For it is he. Yeah, he's, he's from Hull East to, mm. to come on, because uh, we did start a debate yesterday. But I've come across a few facts here, which I'm going to tell you about. Yeah. Hull is named after the River Hull. Its proper name is Kingston upon Hull. That's true. The name of the king's town upon Hull, given to it by Edward I in 1299. Now, this is the interesting one. On St George's Day in 1642, King Charles I was refused entry to Hull. This led to the siege of Hull and the start of the English Civil War. Really? Yeah. Blimey, I didn't know that Hull was at the centre of all that. (coughs) Excuse me. Yeah. Right, the George Hotel in Hull... Yeah. It's famous for one ridiculous thing. OK. It's got the smallest window in England. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, who cares? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm certain, yeah. yeah. I, because there's a place that, where Charles Dickens used to write some of his uh, tomes yes. down in East London. Yes. Uh, which is above, it's down by Limehouse there. That's okay. got a tiny, tiny window, like really? almost like a porthole. Yeah. You well, sure it's smaller than that? Well, it says so. Uh, people from Hull are referred to as Hellensians. Hellensians. Yeah, because we couldn't find out what they were. We were calling them Hellonians yesterday. Uh, Hellonians, that's right. Boiled sweets, mm. liquid crystal displays, but most of all... Mm. Lemsip, of which I am currently digesting two plastic Lemsip's capsules made in Hull. every four hours. And you w- shouldn't take more than four of them in a day, by the way. No, I know that. Was, Otherwise, you'll overdose on uh, paracetamol. Was invented in Hull. Invented? Yeah. Really? Yeah, Lemsip. You can't even invent Lemsip. 
Well, I suppose they've you don't got invent a, it. No, they have a pharmaceutical company with well, the laboratories. Yeah, you and don't I, invent Lemsip. No, well, you put it together, don't you, as a, as a oh, compact way to take you, you know your medicine. It. Manufa- yeah, well, I yeah. think it was invented there as well. Invented. Um, now it says the sen- the no, sen- you invent electricity. Yeah. Right? And you invent um, uh, okay. you know, something like... Well, I'm saying you can flight. invent Lemsip capsules. invent capsules. Lemsip. Well, I'm saying you can. Right. Um, in the 17th century, thieves, mostly beggars... <laughs> uh, yeah. Are they filthy beggars? Yeah, filthy beggars. <laughs> they prayed from Hell, Hull and Halifax. May the good Hell, Lord... Hell, Hull. Hell. Hell. Hell, Hull and Halifax, right. right. Uh, may the good, H's. May the good, uh, the good Lord deliver us. Halifax mm. was included because it had a gibbet, which was particularly nasty. It was the early form of a guillotine oh, yeah. and cut half your throat off when you dropped... Half your throat? Half your throat, yeah, well, but not all that. of it. Hey? Why not? What, so it didn't behead you? Yeah, so you bled to death on, oh. while you were swinging, you know. There's a lot of violence kind of in this show. Yeah, a lot of violence, did, yeah. yeah. And Hull, oh, this is great, I love yeah. this. Hull for its notorious strictness of its law keepers and its jail, where they sometimes beat the inmates to death if they didn't do what they were told. <laughs> so, so Hull's not got a great record. <laughs> That's Hull in a nutshell. Yeah. There's some more details from old um, uh, Mr. Um, what's his face's expenses, right? Oh yes, um, Carl. Um, Turner. Yes. Uh, in uh, 2001 to 2011, uh, for staffing costs, he uh, charged £68,374, right? Staffing costs, yeah. yeah staffing. That guy's washing his car and all no, that these are people. No, these are people he would employ in, in the House of Commons. I bet he got them to wash his car occasionally. For some reason, mm. right now, 2015, yes. uh, it's ballooned up to 115424 Amazing. So that's uh, practically doubled as well. You're so allowed to, at the needs, public um, expense, to double the cost well, of uh, running your office. I don't know why he suddenly yeah. needs to double the cost of running his office. Maybe he's got a lot more busy. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Have asked one of them who owned the whole Daily Mail. Yeah, he should have done. Yes, because they could have advised him. Yeah, could you go and do a bit of research for me, please? Yeah. Oh yes, what do you mean to do, yeah, Carl? Who owns the local go paper? Find out who owns the local, pay- local paper I've been talking to for yeah. the last six years. Would you? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, fine. We have, as I say, put a call into his office to ask him if he's yep. going to come on. They say they're going to get back to us. Right. Okay. Uh, but maybe there's not enough staff in his office. Of course, he's yep. not working today because no. the MPs don't go back to work until January the 9th. No, that's right. Yeah. But don't worry, they only work for a month and then they take another couple of weeks off in February. Yeah, when you actually get in the summer, ten. Uh, they take the whole of. Uh, of August, yes. most of July, yes. and almost all of September. Yes. And then they come back for a little bit and break for conference season. Yeah. I've always called them questionable people. Yes. You've got a track record for yes. that. You know what I mean? Interesting. And also, yep. poor old Hull yesterday, you'd mm. have to say, uh, your, man, your man, Mr Phelan, yes. uh, was saying he felt very unlucky again yesterday. 3-1, yeah, yeah. they got beaten by West Bromwich yeah. Albion. But, but, you, you see know, that guy, Hal robson Carnu again was uh, influential <laughs> when he came think? on. Influential. Very influential. He, he was, yeah. But unfortunately for Mr Phelan, who mm. I believe to be a very honourable man... He is. He, he, he does look dejected and say he's been hard done to mm. after every defeat. He does. You've got, to, you know, you've got to start turning those defeats... Well, we keep hearing from various football pundits that Hull are a great team. Don't we? We keep hearing they're a great team, and don't worry, they're not going down. But, That's I mean, right. unfortunately, they keep losing. That's right, absolutely. So things are not going well. Now, don't forget, we've got to talk about the big game yeah. uh, coming up tonight, yes. which is Crystal Palace Swansea, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. We'll be Six talking about that. Are, down at the bottom. Um, are we going axe throwing this week, by the way? Well, supposed to be, yeah. Mm. We're trying to get it sorted as we We talked speak. about that with our millions of listeners last yeah. week. In and fact, gonna... I'll try and get an update uh, very shortly, in fact, on and, that. Uh, and will that have to be a non-bladderation type afternoon? Well, according to the guy that we spoke to, right? You can have a drink now, now when you throw an now have a drink. Mm. And now, whether mm. you should, I, you and I should have a drink before we throw them, I don't know. I don't know. The other thing that you I was going to... The other thing I was going to ask you to try this week, yeah. as we uh, have a bit of spare time in the afternoons, mm. was to bake a loaf of bread. Bake a loaf of bread? Well, I rather... We know you loaf face, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I don't know where you got that from. Well, if, I think your face looks like one of those loaves that's sort really? of half baked, you know, like saggy and puffy and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But in fact, well, your head, to be fair, looks as if it's on upside down. Uh, you've got more hair on your face than you got on your head. Uh, I'm not going to respond to that. Uh, but in fact, uh, I have found through my industrial research journals, industrial that, research, yeah, that oh, yeah. Uh, that small bakeries or, almost in. Well, your... you know, I used to work in a bakery. Don't yeah, you? I know you did. That's why I was going to say I think you should bake a loaf of bread because uh, small bakeries almost like in your back room type bakeries in your own kitchen one woman in, in fact has got a micro bakery that she runs out of a skip uh, a former skip it's not a skip what? now it's a no it's not a skip what are you skip. talking What's about a container a container a container in her back well, you don't garden. know the difference between a container and a skip <laughs> they're very similar yeah. a container what a great landlord you must be <laughs> that's right a container in her back garden I'm just going to put a container outside this flat no, okay she, then she that's has, fine she's had a container lifted into her back garden yeah. and converted it into a micro bakery really where she now makes her own bread so I thought you should have a go at that here's right. one from Freddy who yeah, says can on. I receive an abusive birthday greeting from the fat man on the start of my 33rd year please yeah uh, 
go on, uh, give him one, mate. Uh, give him one. Uh, is that early middle age yet? Yeah, go on, give him no, one. No, he's asking it from you. No, no, I don't think so. I don't no. respond to, um, you know... You don't uh, like being called fat, do you? Uh, it's not that I don't. I just think it's abusive to do it in public. Really? I've got so, good... you call me fat, though, sometimes. Ah, uh, yeah, but I mean, that's uh, affectionately... Um, I see. Uh, ...measured, if you see what I mean. Neil Listen. says this, electricity was not invented, it was discovered. That's right. Hashtag plank. Oh, yo, you haven't read that properly. Excuse me, haven't read that properly. What do you mean? What it basically says is, please tell Mr Grumpy Graham that electricity was discovered, no, not invented. No, Neil's... Plank. Neil's so it's uh, used the plank. No, it says electricity was not invented, it was discovered. That's all it says. I love this one here from James, and he's a very observant and clearly a loyal and long-term follower. He says, that old politician, whatever his name is, has picked the wrong fight. Mm. He could become Jay Rayner number two when the he takes on the two names. mics. Yeah, absolutely right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about this from John? He says, maybe Van Gerwen could try and throw a dart while Mike Parry holds the apple in his mouth. <laughs> hey, that would be a bit harsh. <laughs> what happened if he uh, got it in, so uh, to speak? Uh, yeah. and Wilco says, any chance uh, Michael Van Gerwen can throw a dart at Porky's head whilst he's blindfolded? Mm, yeah. That's not a bad idea, yeah, is it? Yeah, that's a, not a good idea. Look, Sri mm. Lizzie, who's a regular correspondent, very um, kindly sends us some information on Hull. She says, uh, no, that's the wrong one, isn't it? She says, uh, yeah, she says that flying lady came from uh, Hull, but um, Rod Hull didn't. Sorry, yeah. no, that's not from uh, Liz. That's from a guy called Lord Martin. He says, against popular belief, Rod Hull with Emu did not come from Hull. Rod but- Hull. <laughs> Rod Hull. Yeah, no, he didn't come yeah. from Hull. No, I know that, yeah. Um, Where did he come from? Uh, Rod Hull. He was a Man United fan, wasn't he? Yeah, he came from Lancaster. Did he? Yes, I remember okay. that. How about uh, this from Dean? I'm oh, sorry, Hang on, excuse me. But lesser, known pi- but lesser known pilot Amy Johnson was born there. Oh, right. She went missing, didn't she? She's the one who went missing, yeah. yeah. That's right. Did yeah. they not find a plane recently? No, they thought they'd found a plane on a Rhode Island somewhere off Australia, but when they got there and had a look at it, it wasn't hers. No, OK. Mm. Pete says, uh, the list of Carl Turner's expenses is very interesting. Why is he not accepting uh, MG's invite to come on air? Well, uh, you can, but uh, but judge that for Speculate yourself. Speculate on that Dean one. says this, Paul yeah. The standards Hull MP couldn't be any worse than the expenses grabbing incumbent. Uh, well, I'm not an expenses grabber, actually. Look, she does, he does send a note. She says, round and round and round they go. The two mics, what time they're on, nobody knows. Thank mm. you very much indeed. Well, it's not that difficult. We're yeah. on from 10 to 1 all exactly. this week, and then we're on the warm up uh, yeah. from uh, 10 to uh, 11 to 1, in fact. 11 to 1 on Saturday. On Saturday, which is FA Cup Day, of course. <laughs> Excuse me. Although yes, it's FA Cup Friday Day. Night. Martin's got the wrong end of the stick. He says, Mr. Turner's spot on about the Daily Mail bile paper. Trouble is, Martin, uh, he was criticising the whole Daily Mail, yes. uh, which in fact is not a bile paper, no, as you not. would call it, uh, even though uh, I would disagree with you about the Daily Mail yeah, as well. Exactly. You try and uh, work your facts out, Martin, before sending sweets and make you look ridiculous. That's right. And Charlie here is paying tribute to Dom McGuinness. And they, uh, Tom's should, a very fine man. He should, because Dom is a first-class correspondent to uh, Talk Sport. He says, uh, great to hear Dom McGuinness's balance versus old Porky Parry's bluster, repep's behaviour yesterday. That's true, yeah. Yeah, well, OK. Well, uh, you know, I've always had terrific uh, relationship with Dom. He's the best. Yeah, he loves you too, I think. Yes, that's right. The point mm-hmm. about uh, about what uh, Dom McGuinness was saying about Pep is that, yes. you know, journalists are not, uh, you know, shy and retiring characters. I don't, I yes. don't think you should pick on uh, on Pep Guardia for being rude to journalists. Yes. Because sometimes people are rude to journalists. Mm-hmm. goes with the territory, as, as Dom says. There's yes. no reason for him to, to demand that Pep Guardiola is nice to him. Absolutely. It makes no difference at all. Absolutely. However, it's not so much in whether he's nice to the journalist yes. or not. It's about what he's saying and why he's saying it. I totally and agree. And we're going to find out from a behaviourist, I think, uh, what uh, Pep Guardiola's body language means. Because you were saying earlier, yeah. you noticed that he was sort of flicking his nose, he, it, was, he, he, was, was, he was scratching his cheek. It's like he had a rubber is face not, and he was kept squeezing it for comfort. Is that not the comfort? sort of thing that somebody often does when they're not quite telling the truth? Well, um, Or they're sort of acting shiftily. It's not acting shiftly. Or they, or they don't believe in what they're saying. It's, it's when somebody feels completely uncomfortable and not able to sort of get with it, you know what I mean? And, could, it, and, could it not be and actually... And not look people in the eye. Yeah, but could it also be because he's he's being disingenuous, that he's actually kind of pretending to, well, to be mad and pretending to be worked No, up? I don't think so. I really don't. I think that's an accusation too far. I, I, I mean, do you remember that great film um, of a... Uh, what was it? It was a great film about a prisoner of war camp in the Second World War. It no. wasn't The Great Escape. Uh-huh. But what they did was they discovered that if a prisoner became mentally ill and yeah. deranged, right. that um, the... It was red... a bridge over the River Kwai. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't that, no. Uh, this was in Europe. It was a, a German prisoner of war camp. The Red Cross could apply to have the man rehabilitated, or whatever the word is, uh, you know, taken back to his own side. You yeah. know what I mean? That's not called rehabilitation. Well, you mean handed over? Handed back over, yeah, yeah. that's right. So, so this guy, a little Scotsman... Uh, pretended to go mad. Wasn't it the original one where he stuck needles up his nose and what? all that kind of stuff? Yeah. I don't know what oh, no, film no. you're talking no, about. No, this is a great film. Who was in it? 
Um, Do you remember any of the names? Well, I remember the little Scots guy. Was, was a it in black and white? He was in black and white. And he was, right. he was, so he it was made in approximately 1950-something. Something like that. You're absolutely right. And and so he pretended to go mad. Mm. And uh, so he got Stuck repatriated. That's the word, isn't it? Repatriated. Could be. So he's sticking needles up his nose and, and, and walking around with a, uh, you know, a flying broomstick and all this kind of stuff. So the Germans, in the end, thought he's too much trouble as a patient because he is mad and he could do things. Right. So they allowed the Red Cross to take him home. Sadly, when he got home, they discovered that he had actually gone completely mad in mm. pretending to be mad. Well, and there's a, th- just, there's a thin line, I mean? isn't there? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And, and, I think that's what's happened to you. And, <laughs> yeah, that's what <laughs> to me. And, and he was committed to a mental home. Now, what I'm saying yeah. is, if, 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 if uh, Pep has completely lost the plot yeah. in the sense of where is the balance in my life here, I'm being challenged for the first time uh, in the supremacy of being top coach in this country where I'm working, yeah. how soon will it be before he finds it impossible to to handle the burden of that pressure. Well, indeed. Hmm? And, and who knows who his allies are? Yeah. I mean, he's got the uh, former director of football from Barcelona yes. with him now, right? So yes. uh, depending on his relationship with him, mm. uh, that might be going well. But aside from that, yeah. you know, the owners are not really big friends of his. He doesn't know them particularly well. Yes. I don't get the sense that the players are particularly mm. enamoured with him. You know, uh, Don was saying that, you know, he might be trying to protect the players. He's yeah. got a good relationship with some of them, yeah. and particularly the goalkeeper. I mean, it doesn't look like that to no, me. I agree. And if you drop people like Sergio Aguero and David Silva... Yeah. Um, albeit for you know the first half of the game yesterday, yeah. it doesn't necessarily in, in, you, I, know, in sort of, you know imbue you to be friends with. I them, totally it? agree. The old sort of you know great loyalty bond between player and coach is not exactly there. Now listen, we've got to stop talking about Hull in a minute, but uh, Beanie Tony yeah. has uh, sent this one in, which I find to be a bit of a slur on the whole region, really. He says, uh, will you bring the two-mic show to Hull this year, or mm. will you go to somewhere much more glamorous like Grimsby, well, Cleethorpes? Yeah. Or Immingham. Mm. I think Beanie Town is trying to point out that that part of the world is not exactly yeah. the Costa Brava. That's very harsh. You know what this I mean? Is talk sport. Now, we've yeah. talked about Pep Guardiola because uh, we're now going to talk to a body language expert uh, who can perhaps uh, look at the way that Mr. Guardiola has been mm-hmm. behaving over recent weeks, yes. uh, particularly on his uh, interviews yesterday, yes. uh, and to tell us what he thinks uh, is going on. Mm. Because I'm wondering uh, if it's all a bit of an act. We're going to talk to Darren Stanton now uh, and find out from Darren uh, what he makes of it all. Darren, a very good morning to you. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, very, very well, well down, thank very you. Very well indeed. Now, we've mm. been uh, talking to some football fans and we've been sort of analysing it ourselves, but you're obviously an expert in these matters. I mean, it was quite a remarkable kind of um, performance by Pep Guardiola. And I say performance because I think it is a bit of a performance. What do you think? Yeah, quite a bizarre sort of press conference, really. Um, but one thing I looked at, I looked at some other videos as well, where he's sort of a lot more relaxed. And one thing I looked at as a body language expert is what we call a baseline. So how is somebody normally when they're not stressed and, and they're acting quite normally. And, mm. and the BBC interview, they, I think there's a lot of what we call masculine emotion. Mm-hmm. So um, there's something called a micro-expression, which is almost like, let's mm-hmm. say you've got a terrible gift for Christmas and you say, I remember, well, I love it, yeah. but really you don't. It's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to mask that emotion of mm-hmm. oh, I'm not liking it. And, and, and with Pep, I think there's also a lot of anger. Mm. Um, he makes a couple of gestures where he, he sort of jerks his chin out towards the journalist. Yes. Um, at certain times, flares his nostrils quite subtly, and that sort of anger. Yeah, that's, being asked, that's that, the question. That's sort of take me on and don't you take me on, all that kind of stuff, isn't it? What I found most remarkable, Darren, was that in a press conference, all you have to do is sit there and really just back back questions. Why was his hand all over his face? Why was he pulling at his nose and scratching his ear? And, you know, what is that in- indicating or suggesting? He doesn't want to be there or he wants to hide his face or what? Yeah, basically, it's, it's almost like um, we learn this gesture as a kid, so it's what we call a hand-to-mouth gesture, and generally it's for reassurance. So, A, he doesn't want to be there. He feels quite uncomfortable in that situation, and also to kind of reassure himself. So any gestures where we pull our ears or touch our face, which he did, did a lot of in that interview, so it is pretty much like, I don't want to be here, and mm. I'm just kind of reassuring myself, mm. really. Mm-hmm. Is it partly to do with what some have suggested, that, that, that it's an arrogance about Pep Guardiola, that he doesn't like the fact that uh, for years and years and years people told him that the Premier League was a much more difficult league to win in, uh, and now that he's in it and he's finding that that might be true, um, he feels sort of slightly, I don't know, um, disappointed with himself? I think, yeah, that's, that's quite a good point. I think at the end of the day he's come here, and maybe like you say, so he'd be kind of thought he'd, he'd smash it instantly, and because yeah. it's, he's finding it... A lot more challenging. And I know on the interview, you know, he flips the question back to the, the journalist and says, well, you're the expert, you know, and asks the ref. So it was quite antagonistic. Um, rather than just kind of going with the interview and answering the question, um, I did see, again, quite a lot of anger being sort of 
um, redirected back at the journalist in terms of like, what you know, how dare you ask me this question almost. Yeah. Yeah. Darren, I've always had the view that sometimes these managers, when they snap, their attitude is, look, I've got tens of millions of pounds in the bank. We know that because we've read stories about the wealth accumulated by the world's top coaches. Is their attitude sometimes, I don't have to sit here and take this? I think, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of people in this sort of area that it is very much that, that, you know, know, I'm I'm the best at what I do. It is almost arrogance and Mm. condescension. I'm the best Mm. at what I do. You know, how dare you sort of challenge me, challenge my methods. Mm. You know, I've got all this wealth and I'm here to do a job. And and I think it's a part of the job that a lot of managers don't really like to do Mm -hmm. is, is having to justify their actions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, justify their actions, certainly. But his 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 whole demeanour, looking at his, his whole body language situation, look at the way he was mm-hmm. fidgeting, looking at the way that he was incommunicative, does this give Definitely. you give you the, the view that there's a man sitting there in a place he doesn't want to be, particularly as he then went on to start talking about his life of retirement in years to come? Maybe that's coming sooner than we think. I mean, yeah, that's the other thing that I was going to come on to, is the fact that one of the things is also flashing is... Um, this marker expression, which is like a fifth of a second, but if you slow the foot he's down, he flashes a lot of sadness as well. So mm. maybe he feels like he's bit off more than he can chew. Um, he wants to come in and obviously achieve massive things, um, and it's just not working out the way he thought. So yeah, maybe he's already thinking about jumping ship. I mean, he's quite an animated mm. character, isn't he? I mean, he's in the technical area, jumping about all the time. He's he's drinking from uh, uh, you know a bottle of water. He's he's running around Definitely. inside inside the white lines. Blaming he's, the crowd for not enough noise. Yeah, he was he was winding the crowd up more or less, saying that they they weren't making enough noise when he came out for the second half. You yeah. know, I mean, is there anything you can deduce from that? Because some managers are a bit calmer on the uh, on the sidelines, others are a bit more animated. Sometimes you get the impression that's all for show as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that came out from interviews I've watched as well is the fact that that, that is a frustration for him, isn't it? He's saying that the, the supporters aren't fully behind him as much as he, he would like to see. Um, and again, there's you know, the differences culturally, you know, people behave in different ways. But I think certainly in this last interview, there's been a definite shift in, in a, the, the amount that he's prepared to sort of interact and engage with journalists. Uh, and the media, mm. um, and I think there's been a definite shift in terms of the level of animation, because like you say, he's a very animated guy, mm. um, and one of the things that we look for um, when people are tending to mask emotion or they're not firing all four cylinders, is a change in body language, and, and what, what, what I saw in the interview that you sent me with the BBC is mm. a, a definite shift in terms of him being a lot more fidgety, yeah. you know, less, less yeah. animated, less larger than life, really. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? I mean, you do uh, this kind of stuff, obviously, for a living, Darren. I mean, you know about uh, uh, several politicians and the way that they behave as well. And, you know, uh, I was reading a statistic the other day um, that only 7% of overall communication is actually verbal. So when we watch football managers talking to people after games, Mm. it's not something they do a lot of, I don't think. I mean, obviously, they interact with their players. Mm. But most of us don't do that kind of face-to-face type thing on a regular basis, do we? No, I, mean, it's, I think it's quite an abnormal place to be, really, in front of you know a lot of television, te- television cameras and, and journalists. So it's obviously a part of the job that you know probably they, they like the least. I mean, mm. one thing that I do is just going on from what you've said about the non-verbal. Is like you know I will turn the sound down and watch uh, and just watch the non-verbal because, yep. as I said, you know, ninety-seven percent or ninety-three percent of of what's going on is is, uh, is non-verbal, really. Yeah, that is very interesting. So you you can actually detect more from the attitude, the facial expressions, the slight twitch here than you do from what's coming out of their mouth because they may be lying. Yeah, but generally, like the other yeah. kind of what I do is I specialise in deception. So I, you know, as you've said, I sort of assess mm. sure, um, politicians, sure. public figures. So, uh, so yeah, you say, when you say you specialise in deception, you don't mean that you really specialise in deception. No, you're not a DC. You, speci- you specialise in detecting deception, sure. Dete- yeah, yeah. Thanks for pulling me up on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I specialise in, in spotting. So Porky specialises in deception. I mean, he's been doing it for years. That's an outrage. <laughs> that is an absolute outrage. Don't take no notes of in Durham. But thank you very much for joining us today to interpret the body language of. Yeah. Very well, Guardiola, clearly, is a man who's, who's under pressure. He is, yeah. Darren, give us, give us your website if people want to go find it. Yeah, sure. So it's www.darrenstanton.co.uk yeah. or just Google Darren Lie Detector. Mm-hmm. OK. Lovely. Lie Detector. Yeah, yeah, it's like that show Lie to me, Darren Stanton. He's got some interesting things to say there. He seems to be suggesting that, that Pep Guardiola's not putting it on. Uh, and, in fact, yeah. his actions are, would suggest... 
that he's not a very happy bunny. What I think is very interesting from Darren, who's an expert, he mm. looks at the body language first with the sound turned down, right? Yeah. And then he, you know, he can interpret how he thinks they're feeling and how mentally structured they are. Then he watches it again with the sound turned up. And then he fills in all the gaps with what they say, which endorses the view he's taken without knowing what they were saying. Mm. So, you know, this figure you threw at him, some, only 7% of communication in the world is, is the voice yeah. from one person to another. That's an well, amazing... Well, no, it's the face-to-face one. That's what I mean. It's yeah. amazing stuff. It's not, well, voice-to-voice you could do on the phone. I'm talking about actually face-to-face. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Like, I, the way I, you and I are looking at each other yeah. right now. Yes. Uh, and the way that he has to look at a journalist when he's being interviewed. That's right. That's the bit that's only But, 7%. I mean, for, for instance, you know, to give our, our millions of listeners an example, you came to this morning, you said, you see that fascinating story about the Titanic? Yes. And I said, yeah, yeah, of course mm. I did, yeah. And uh, you said it was absolutely brilliant, wasn't it? And I said, what, you mean that... Well, the... brilliant's not a word I use very often. Uh, and, and Nobody I, knows what my actual uh, words. And I said, um, I said, what, you mean it wasn't the iceberg? No, you said it was the fire and all that, you know. Yeah. Now, actually, I, I, I'm completely disinterested in that story. Yeah, um, I can but, tell. But you were fascinated by well, it. I'm but, not fascinated by but it. Then, I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, you're always talking about yeah. the Titanic, yeah. no, but as yeah. usual, no. whenever I yeah. suggest something that you've never yes. heard of yes. and you then pretend you've heard mm, of it, mm. uh, you don't want to do it. But then later, you see, when you tried to raise it again with somebody else yeah. and somebody else said, oh, that sounds interesting, yeah. and you said, no, 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 Porky's not interested no, in that. No, because you're not. And, and but, I can tell that. But you detected that from my body language, exactly, didn't you? Exactly, yes. You see what I mean? Yeah, because I know you inside out. You see what out. I mean? Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is you pretty quickly cottoned on yeah. that this load of rubbish you were telling me about the Titanic was <laughs> a, not a load z- of rubbish. zero interest to not. me whatsoever. It's the fact that there was because, actually a fire it, burning. No, it was, was nothing to do with the fire. For three weeks, which weakened the uh, the steel of the hull. It didn't. There's that word hull again. It, it didn't hull. Yeah, yeah. hull, that's right, yeah. The, the reason the, the fire was burned for three weeks yeah. was because the stokers were chucking coal into the boilers no, incorrect. to heat the steam no. to make the propellers go no. round. No, no. No, I'm it, telling you. No, the fire, I'm telling you. I'm Never telling you, Jim. Brendan Jeanette. Rogers mode. No, mm. the point is is that it was burning inside a part of the hole where there shouldn't have been a fire. No, rubbish. And it therefore weakened the steel, which uh, then meant that when the iceberg crashed against it, yes. it was much weaker than it should have been and, and therefore uh, created uh, a huge hole. No, and how come 104 years later you've come up with this theory? It's not eh? my theory. Yeah. It's a yeah. theory that's come from Northern Ireland. Island where the ship was built. But it's hocus-pocus. Well, it, 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 it's, yeah, like you've never uh, come up with any uh, rubbish on this well, show. Well, the idea, hey? that because there's a bit well, of... Is that, is that the new... What, you're setting on. a new bar? Uh, well, on. you can't talk about rubbish anymore. Hang on. Because there was a bit of a fire burning somewhere within the um, Titanic, yeah. you just suddenly suggest, ooh, it softened the metal. It did. How ridiculous. Well. Do you know how hot metal's got to go to yeah, be malleable? Yeah, tell me? Over a thousand degrees <laughs> centigrade, right? What are you talking about? And do you know how hot a fire is? Yeah. A domestic fire, which is all you can burn on the Titanic, it's a ship. A domestic fire? Yeah, yeah. Could never oh, you get... know, there's a furnace on there. What? There's a furnace well, on the there. Well, the furnace was where they, as I've told you, where the stokers were chucking the coke <laughs> in to <laughs> turn the propellers fire. around, OK? Yeah, you're talking absolute the cobblers. I... Well, we're... Seen the time, Sorry, who started this fire, then? Who started this fire? The fire started by accident. Oh, and it was burning for three weeks? Uh, yeah. And the 1,200 members it of the got... crew on the Titanic yep. couldn't find a fire extinguisher no, and put couldn't. a fire out they for three weeks? They didn't have fire extinguishers then. Oh, didn't they? No. Oh, really? No. And nobody thought that the fire might start on the QE2. It wasn't the QE2. Uh, uh, sorry, on the I'm Titanic. Lose the plot there. <laughs> on the Titanic. Look, you're losing this one. You might as well no, stop not. now. I'm not. There I don't are. believe there were you no fire... the Titanic, the QE2. I do not believe that there were no fire extinguishers on the Titanic. When do you think the fire the extinguisher Titanic? was uh, invented? A long time before 1912. Really? Which is when the uh, Titanic sure? went down. Yeah, did, did, they, did they have them during the fire of London? They had them during the, uh, they? They had them during the Boer they? War. I know that for a fact. The Boer War? Yeah. Well, they all had fire extinguishers strapped to their back. In eight, <laughs> the Boer War was in 1894, and they had fire extinguishers right. then. We'll find out yeah, when the fire extinguishers definitely. were invented. What a ridiculous uh, theory. Yeah, we've got lots of... And it wasn't at sea for three weeks, anyway. I have some information which is going to make you, um, you know, recount <laughs> some of your uh, oh, yeah. wilder information statements. information have you got? Wilder statements, OK? Some information about what exactly? The modern fire extinguisher the was invented extinguisher. by a British sea captain, George William Manby. George William Manby? Yes. Yes. In 1818. Oh, yeah. What did it look like? It looked like a copper vessel of three gallons of pearl ash potassium carbonate. What? Uh, what does put that in, look like? Put into solution. Excuse it's grey. What it's does gray. that look like? It's grey. It's grey. And contained well, a cylinder. And contained within the cylindrical tube uh-huh. with compressed air. Upon release of the button at the top of the cylindrical tube, the uh, potassium carbonate ash comes out and extinguishes fire. What? So, and do you know how many of those there were on the uh, Titanic? Uh, tell me. A hundred. <laughs>
A hundred. A hundred. Well, that didn't do very well, so, did it? So I was going to say, could yeah. you explain to me now, please, this fire that was raging for three weeks on the Titanic, by the way, uh, that must have been for two weeks while it was still on dry that's land correct, before yeah. it was launched, Yes, right? it was, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Why did nobody put it out with the because fire they extinguisher? Because apparently they weren't able to. And also, if you had any brains whatsoever, which you clearly don't, because no, you've no, lost no, them no, all over no, the no, years of abuse, no, right? you're the one without the brains, no, pal. You've lost them all because of years of abuse. Mm. I mean, if you see what sorts of fires go on in mm. industrial situations, you can't just take a little tiny fire extinguisher and go, ooh, I'll just squeeze this on it and it'll go out. Why didn't anybody alert the captain of the Titanic? OK, because who, they who didn't was, want uh, to tell anybody, right? Right. This is the, this only is, body that was a fire on board. Right, before we go any further here, <laughs> so that I can make this clear to you, <laughs> so you can see that you don't like the story, right? This is not my theory, OK? Yeah. I don't know anything yeah. about the Titanic yeah. well, why are you other defending than the fact it, then? I'm not defending it. Yeah. All I, you see, the difference between you and I mm. is that you think everything is a, is a war, that you have to either win or lose, no, right? No, Sadly, no, no. just to look at you, yeah. anyone can tell that you're a massive loser. You see, okay? you're, getting, see you're getting all here's upset what, now, aren't you? Here's what the story says. You've been made to look at an oaf. No, here's what the story says, OK? Mm. This was um, a TV programme that went out um, a few days ago, and it was an Irish journalist who did the research on it because, right. of course, mm. as you know, mm. um, it did, in fact... Uh, it was, in fact, built in Northern Ireland, right? In Belfast, Little right? Holland and Wolf. Experts have previously acknowledged the theory of a fire on board, but new analysis of rarely seen photographs mm. has prompted researchers to blame the fire as the primary cause of the ship's demise, OK? Mm. Now, what they're saying is, is that you're quite right, the fire did start before the, the Titanic set sail. But it was, it was they didn't yeah. want to they didn't want to cancel the sailing of the Titanic because it was a massive thing for what White was Star. Burning? Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, Mr. Maloney, Sean, uh, Sean Maloney, right? Mm-hmm. Who's the guy who spent thirty years researching the sinking of the Titanic? Right. It's his theory. Yeah. It's not my theory. I'm just telling you what he thinks. But okay? defending it, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, what he said is, you look at the exact area where the iceberg struck, and mm. there appears to have been a weakness or damage to the hull in that specific place before the ship even left Belfast. Yeah. Okay. A team of 12 men apparently attempted to put out the flames, but it was too large to control, reaching temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. OK? Yeah. The, the, which I've told the you fire, is, the, is, the, the, is the temperature at which, which, uh, which metal, metal starts to which, melt. Which exactly starts to weaken, yeah. yeah. The fire started in a three-storey high fuel store behind one of the ship's boiler rooms. Mm-hmm. And that's where the fire supposedly went, and they couldn't put it out. Sorry. And they kept trying to control it, but it obviously the effect of it going for three weeks somehow weakened the metal so that when the iceberg hit it, that was why it made a massive hole in it. Well, didn't anybody think that just before the ship left Southampton, because, of course, it was built in Harland and Walls, it yeah. then sailed down through the Irish Sea, you know, around the English Channel to Southampton. When it got to Southampton, did nobody think about ringing the local fire brigade and saying... Well, I mean, it's all very easy excuse for you, me, as usual. It's all very easy we, for you to poo-poo these things, right? We've got a fire on board the Titanic. Yeah. You haven't got a spare fire well, engine. Come and put it can, out of you, please. If you, can, if you can attempt to take away your, yeah. you know, your glee at the fact that you can yeah. somehow... Pour yes. cold water on this. No, get I it? am. Get it? Um, <laughs> yes. The point is. Well, nobody right, did, did the they? Point, That's the point, no, the point yes. is, is that during this time, have you any idea how big mm. of a story the Titanic was? Mm. The fact that it was going to be the fastest ship ever yeah. to go grand transatlantic. The fact that it was mm. the most luxurious liner that had ever been built. Yeah. The fact that everybody who was anybody was going to go on it. Yeah. They didn't want to turn around as it was about to leave Southampton and say, oh, yeah. by the way, there's a fire on board because yeah. they thought they could put it out. I see. Yeah. And it turned out they couldn't. Listen to this. But, but they Listen had to weeks this. to put it out. No. Listen to this. They thought it was under control. Well, you know? it, yeah, well, it clearly Things wasn't. Were, well, on. it clearly wasn't. Yeah. Things were done in those days slightly differently than they are. <laughs> they, they certainly I mean, were, you, yeah. can, you, can, you only have to go back 30 years in this mm. country mm. to find criminal negligence mm. by large organisations mm. on quite a massive scale. Mm. Would you agree? Uh, I don't know what you're getting at, but uh, well, just, you, you get negligence in all forms of all areas all the time. Well, imagine on, what yeah. it was like in 1912, OK? The official mm. Titanic inquiry, says Mr Maloney, mm. branded the sinking as an act of God. But mm. this isn't a simple story of colliding with an iceberg and sinking. It's a perfect storm of extraordinary factors mm. coming together. Fire, ice and criminal negligence. Yeah. Nobody's investigated these marks before. We have metallurgy experts telling us that when you get those levels of temperature against steel, it makes it brittle. The fire was known about, but it was played down, and the ship should never have been put to sea. He then describes how the boat was actually uh, backed into uh, the berth at Southampton in a particular way, so that nobody could see the marks on the outside of the hull. There's so much nonsense. I mean, the captain must have known about the fire. Well, it's a theory. So you said, don't you want a big story the launch of the Titanic was? Didn't the captain say, well, it would be an even bigger story if the ship burns to death? 
you know, well, in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, halfway across to New might, York. It would have been well even say, bigger. You might as well say, uh, was there anyone in thalidomide who at the time said to the board, by the way, you know that this, this uh, drug no, causes... No, completely different. No, it's not it's... completely different. People don't say things sometimes because they're frightened of being fired. Thalidomide was not apparent to the naked eye. If it had been, it would never have been well, launched yes, as a drug. Course, it's a completely different course, situation. No, it's not. People inside of that company knew that there were problems with the drug. Everybody... They knew that birth defects were possible, but they just said nothing. Every... If it wasn't for the Sunday Times investigation, yeah. they would never have found out. It, it, uh, I think it's rather an unfortunate uh, comparison, to be honest. Because not at all. Everybody who was a member of the crew on the Titanic must have at some time been told, oh, by the way, don't go down to deck, you know, minus four at the far end of the ship. And if why not? Well, it's on fire. What do you mean it's on fire? You're yeah. telling me nobody raised the alarm in Southampton and said, I don't think this ship should sail. Oh, why not? It's on fire. Yeah. Oh, is it? Well, it doesn't look like it's on well, fire. It I, is know, on fire. It was, it's as if I'm talking to a seven-year-old. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, have you it's never... It's as if you're you trying never, to convince a, a I mean, if you've never been a proper journalist in your life, you might have uncovered the odd piece of stuff that somebody had done that they didn't want to be made public. Excuse me. Some people keep things hidden. Some Excuse people me. don't Excuse like me. the truth to come out. Excuse me. Some people need journalists to actually yeah. investigate things yes. and find out precisely what is going on. Excuse me. You are talking to the man who told the world yeah. about the very sad demise and death of Diana Prince. Well, it wasn't Wales. exactly an investigation, was it? That's I a news event. I broke the news that's to a, the world. That's a news event. I broke the news to the world. Yeah. Do you not understand the difference? Puts me to the top of my profession. No. Do you not okay? understand? The, do you not understand the difference? Of course I do. You've you're never been to the top of anything. You're trying to tell me that even as the ship was leaving Southampton, I'm not just one, telling you what this guy's not theory one single is. ship steward, you know, the sort of John Prescott type guy, well, you know, John the guy Prescott types wouldn't know that it was going on. Didn't lean over the rail and say, "Excuse me." Does anybody know this ship is on fire before we... I mean, it's okay. so ridiculous. Have you ever been in the bo- in the engine room of a steamship? Yes. Really? Yes. When? Uh, years ago. Years ago? On a school trip to Liverpool. Where on we a school went, trip to Liverpool? Uh, well, it was to Birkenhead, actually, to Camel Ed, to see a ship being built. Really? Yes. And so they were still building steam steamships when you were a child? Yeah. How amazing. Yeah, How yeah, old yeah. are you? Yeah, sorry? How old are you? I'm, uh, I'm entering early middle ages. Did I you told notice you a particular smell in that boiler room? Well, boiler room smell of grease and oil and, and that and, sort of stuff, OK? And? And what? And? And metal. And what about and coal? Heat. And heat. And what about coal? No, no, not, not not in that part of the ship. The part of the ship I saw were the pistons going where up the down. Boil, where do you think the boiler room is called the boiler room? The boiler room's at the other end well, and I it feeds the steam been, down. I asked you if you've been in the boiler room. No, I'm in the boiler room. You hadn't been. Well, the boiler right. room for? where the smoke my, my point is, is that, you know, down there... It's a conversation. Well, you're, you're the, the one that said you want to talk about it. You're the one... I just think it's interesting... I just wanted to point out to you that... I just think it's an interesting theory. Well, I think you're crazy. Yeah, Listen, I've got some good news for you. Have you? We can change the subject because this is great news. What has been found in a research paper is the fact that the reason that people get fat is not sometimes uh, their own fault. There is a gene in the body Uh that if you've got it, you can't help but get fat, Okay. Yes. Um, I think that's true. I think no. that, not always true for everybody, but certainly yes. true for some people. Yes, and and uh, what what it is is uh, I'm going to. It's called the Grillis gene, okay? Grillis? Yeah, the Grillis gene. As in bear grills, you mean? Yeah, that's right. That sort of thing. And if well, you, what do you mean that sort of thing? Is it the same spelling or not? Um, well, it's spelt several different ways depending on which research paper you're looking at. <laughs> but, uh, no, 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 no. How no. can it be spelt three different ways? Well, because I'm, I'm I'm telling you what happens is what happens is right. If you've got it, you can do everything you want. You can have a Gastric band, you can have everything else. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, it's my cold. But um, Are you all right? But, yeah, yeah, I'm, very, I'm fine. But How many lump sips have you had since we started the show? I uh, haven't had any since we started the show. I'm yeah. taking the capsules, not the lump sips. That doesn't make it any better. Uh, no, it's called, sorry, I've got it here. It's the hunger hormone called a ghrelin. What? Ghrelin. Ghrelin? Yes, ghrelin. Ghrelin? You can, you can go on any diet you want, you have a gastric band and everything, but if you have the hunger hormone known as ghrelin and right. it's active in your body... Have you got it? No, I haven't. How do you know? Hey, How do you know whether you got it? Well, I haven't got a weight problem, so I haven't <laughs> got it. What do you mean you haven't got a weight problem? How much do you weigh? What is that? What, what are you talking about? According to Dr Banner, right? Yeah, yes. 99 kilograms. What? That's what Dr Banner's letter says. No, 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 no. It's That's n- what it's, it says. It's, it's much near 85, actually. Since when? What? It was 99 when he weighed you. No, it wasn't. It was. I've got the letter. Do do I have to tweet the letter out? No, no. Now, listen, let me just uh, tell you this. Right. Why are you incapable of telling the truth? It is the hormone ghrelin that tells the brain that our stomachs need refuelling while the stomach should cease producing ghrelin once full, sending a signal to the brain to stop eating. For some, the chemical message simply never goes back the other way. How about that? Uh, I've no idea what you're talking about. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yeah, I've got a lot of good tweets here about the fire, but we'll get to those later. Convinced that this was the case, um, one particular patient spoke to her GP 
She was told there was little that could be done, even if it is the case, except for following the usual weight loss advice to consume fewer calories than she burns in physical activity. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm suffering. I think we should stop talking for five minutes. Uh, undeterred, Give you a chance to get your voice back. Undeterred, a number of patients, someone often had um, special investigative treatment to find they have got the grilling hormone, and that once you've got it, there's nothing you can do. Really? Mm. So I thought I'd let you know. Yeah, thanks. So anybody out there who is battling now in the new year to lose weight, uh, who wants to go onto a diet, who wants to maybe, you know... Well, you could do, you know, Dr Bannon wants you to go on a diet. Uh, no, that's he not does. true. If I would go and get yourself tested, please, to find out if you've got the hormone ghrelin, because if you've got the ghrelin hormone, you've got no chance. Really? You've got absolutely no chance. <laughs> This no, is talk it's sport. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. This is talk yeah. sport. And of course, coming up a little bit later on, it's Ask Porky. If you haven't ever had yep. a problem solved live on the air, yep. uh, you can call us and you can have a problem solved. Uh, we can get That's that right. guy Cole Turner ringing up if he's got uh, a problem he wants to have solved. Uh, uh, who's that? The, uh, the, the uh, yeah, we haven't heard from uh, police. I think it is. Uh, yeah, we haven't police heard from his office yet. He doesn't want to no, come on no, at the no, moment. But no, we no. shall see. Uh, here's one from Kimberley on Ooh. the subject of the Titanic. Uh, I watched the documentary. There was a fire. Uh, Robin says, sorry, Mr. Parry, but Mike Graham is correct, Ray the Titanic. Yeah. Uh, if you watch the Channel 4 documentary, you'll see that the coal bed fires burn at 500 to 1,000 degrees centigrade. I told you that. And uh, here's one from uh, um, uh, Dave. He Ooh. says, the World Trade Center in New York collapsed after the intense heat of the burning kerosene weakened the steel structure. Yes. Indeed. Uh, and Stu says, mm. what a plank pork he is. Mm. He obviously never watched the Titanic program and as normal, it, talks total excuse tosh. Me, excuse me, nobody's talks explained to me tosh. why nobody could put the fires on board the Titanic. Well, why and why you... nobody actually alerted the authorities in Southampton to say, you know... The fire the... was in one of the coal chambers where it smouldered for three weeks, says Damon. So you know... it was not a huge... Yeah. You know, the point yeah. is, the po- what you don't understand about fire uh, could be written large all over the walls of this studio. Oh, you're studio. an expert, are you? I'm not an expert, you but I don't pretend to be... You must have the Towering Inferno, did you, with Steve McQueen? The world does, not revolve, the world does not revolve around... Yeah. Are you sure Steve McQueen was even in that? Yeah, it was. You think it was also Gene Hackman, wasn't it? No, it was, well, it was Gene Hackman, but Steve McQueen was in it as well. Sure? I'm certain. All right. Certain. Towering Inferno. Towering Inferno. So your entire world is governed by what uh, you've seen uh, in the movies. Well, the Towering Inferno went ablaze because uh, they used cheap uh, wiring. Mm. And, um, and uh, you know, it was all a sort of bosh job. Cheap wiring. Yeah, anyway, yeah. the point is, is this was a smouldering fire. So it mm. wasn't a, a fire that sort of yeah. went, uh, you know, with great flames flying everywhere up through the, through the cabins. Yeah. And where was this fire taking place again? Well, I just told you, it was, it was behind one of the fuel storage units. It's in where they were storing the coal. Yeah. And it was one of those things. And I can't go on and on about it because it will bore people to death. Of course it will. All I'm saying is it's a fascinating theory which is worth looking Why at. Why didn't they open a hatch on the side of the Titanic and chuck all the smouldering coal into oh, the sea? Oh, what, you mean make a big hole in the side of the ship? No, they would have hatches all around no, the ship. Yes, they do. To, to drain water no, and all sorts rubbish. of things. And you then, have no understanding when of you, ships when, either. When you throw burning coal into the English Channel, it stops burning, actually. What? Yeah, that's what they could have done. I mean, look, they were surrounded by water in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Why didn't they pump a bit of water into this chamber where the yeah. coal was burning? You've never heard of a burning. ship actually going down, have you, in, in, in flames? That's no, no, happens. no, the Titanic was unsinkable because it was compartmentalised. Mm. That's why they called it the unsinkable ship. Yeah, it was unsinkable. So, so all they had to do was, was close yeah. off two of the compartments, yeah. pump water in and mm. put out the fire. So it's a, it's a rubbish, utter rubbish thing. And what theory. happened to the ship? Well, the ship sank because because the compartments that should have been sealed off weren't sealed off. Yeah, right. I've seen all the Titanic films. I know the history You've of it. Seen all the Titanic that. films. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Now, what you think, did you have for breakfast? By the way, by the way, the what? first one. What a ridiculous title, you know, with Kenneth uh, Williams. Was it no Kenneth, Kenneth Williams? Kenneth Moore. What carry on Titanic? <laughs> no, 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 no. You idiot. Kenneth Moore. They, you know, this is the greatest ship disaster in history, mm. and they called it a night to remember. Did they? <laughs> Surely it was a Are night to sure? forget, wasn't well, it? I would have yeah, it was so. called a night to remember. I would have thought so. With Kenneth Moore. Mm. Um, sorry, what are you talking I about? I asked you what you had for breakfast. Because on, yeah. on your way in here, yeah. right, you told me that you were crushed into a train. Yes. So you wouldn't have been able to have your normal sort of sausage roll in the privacy and comfort of a very quiet carriage. I never do that anyway. Do. I don't like eating in public. And I think you're people always who getting are sausage rolls on the train. You told me rubbish, that. Rubbish, rubbish. Well, what about the time you went back via Croydon and the guy I, gave I, you a uh, six-inch long sausage roll? Hang, hang on. I did late at night once when the train was empty, but I do not inflict the, you know, the pervasive well, you wouldn't atmosphere do it in Russia. of hot food no. on a train you upon other do people. It. You would not do it in Russia. I wouldn't do it any time. This, what, this morning, I've decided on a new uh, new diet for the new year, and I now eat two giant crumpets each morning. Giant? Yes. When you say giant crumpets? They're huge, huge. How big? And what in circumference, would you say? Uh, I would say... Or they, radius, even? I would say they're the radius of a saucer. The radius of a saucer? Yeah, a saucer that you put a cup on, you know? They're about that big. That is quite a big crumpet. Yeah, it is, yeah. What do you put on it? Uh, only... Um, 
healthy but healthy type uh, butter substitute. <laughs> healthy type yeah. butter substitute. Yeah. yeah. Well, what make is that? It's, healthy type butter substitute. It's, um, you mean I can't believe it's not butter? It's one of those. No, it's more like sort of olive oil type stuff. Oh, I know that stuff. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What's it mm. called? I don't know, but it's. I can't uh, remember. But it's got like a sort of olive on the front. Yes, right? that's right. Yes, Why absolutely. Don't you eat regular butter. Um, trying to lose weight. Uh, no, not particularly, but I, you know, I am aware of uh, what you've got to uh, fill your arteries up with and what you, you don't fill your <laughs> arteries up with. No. I don't think the point is to fill up your arteries. Well, so you don't fill up your arteries with anything, do you? You're supposed to, um, to keep them healthy. Um, anyway, uh, that is all by the by. But that's a new thing for you, isn't it? You didn't always eat crumpets. I've loved crumpets for years, but they've always found them to be very fattening if you put uh, butter on them, because yeah, that's exactly. what you're supposed to put on them. So is this, um, no, this is obviously a part of some new uh, regime of yours, right? Uh, yes, it is a new regime. You see, yeah. I compare it to mm. the sort of stuff that you put out. For instance, I've got a picture, a little Hungarian goulash with Goulash last pepper, night was very good, And yes. notchy to keep the cold away tonight. And what? Uh, notchy. Gnocchi. Gnocchi, is it? Gnocchi. What's gnocchi? Yeah, it's a sort of potato-based pasta. Is it? OK. Yeah, and, nice. and you find that very nourishing, this uh, cold uh, weather, do very you? Very nourishing, yeah. Yes, OK, all right, yeah. well... I made the, uh, I made the, uh, <laughs> well, the goulash, actually. I kind of accept that. I made the goulash the day before. I made the goulash the day before. Mm. Um, OK. Why? Sorry? Why? Well, I'm just wondering why, you know, you store all these things at home and then you eat... And why do you have to put out a picture of everything that you cook and I eat? I don't. I don't put a picture out of everything that I cook at mm. but I just occasionally put out pictures of yep. things that I cook because people like me to, okay. because they're always asking me for the recipes, which we are supposedly going to do yep. on our new website right. once that ever gets launched. OK, now um, then... But we don't know when that is yet, do we? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about this. Mm. I've got some sort of irritation of the lungs. You've but got a cold. Got a bit of a cold. Yeah. Now then, you went home deliberately early yesterday because you were going to solve the problem of the car that cannot be moved. Uh, no, I was going to so try. So what have we done with it? I was going to try to do that, but uh, I didn't actually solve the problem of the car that cannot be moved. No, I'm going to try and do that today. Yeah, yeah. And and what are you going to do? Well, see, the thing is, right? I've got this insurance policy um, with the new car. So the breakdown yes. cover comes with that, right? Yes. I've also got an insurance policy from the bank, mm-hmm. which covers breakdown on other cars. But yes. I'm not sure at the moment about a car which is technically out of commission mm. because the car is it's not been taken off the road. It's still got road tax. It's still got an MOT. Why don't you just literally pay somebody to go and take it away? Because you're not well, going to flog it to anybody, well, are no, you? The guy who lives in the building wants to buy it. Well, then in that case, he should take some initiative in getting the car open so he can get into it if he wants it that much, shouldn't yeah. he? Hey? Well, not really. I mean, uh, I should make sure that the car goes and, and so that he should, he can drive around in it and decide yeah. whether he likes it or not. Yeah, you say that. You know, so it's a real pain in the neck at the moment. It, it certainly is. Uh, now, listen, when you go to Par- Borough Market all the time, right, you buy all this food mm. that you... Uh, do you have a... Um... Funnily enough, when you were talking about bread a moment ago. Yes, uh, was, making yeah. bread. They've got a bread school there. Right, go on. So yeah. you can go there, because I was going to take my kids there, because mm-hmm. I thought it might be quite good fun for them to actually learn how to make bread with their hands. Yes. And I went in there, and they had this whole kind of class of about 15 people. Yes. Uh, mostly grown ups, mm-hmm. and I said, "Do you do mm-hmm. a course for kids?" And they said, "No, we don't." Right. And I said, "Well, how much is the course for mm. uh, um, mm. for, for, for say a twelve year old if it was to pay the same price as an adult? Eighty six quid. Eighty six quid for what? Sorry, for the for the day for to, to learn how to make bread. Really, it's quite a lot of money, isn't it? You could do you can learn that from a book, I'm sure. Well, I mean, the, the, you get a big experience. If yeah, you of course you do. School. Yeah, yeah, so I suppose that's so. slightly different. John Lennon uh, went home and made John bread Lennon. for two years. Yeah. How can you bring John Lennon into a conversation about bread? Uh, uh, there's a famous quote in which, in which he was asked what John. he'd been doing yeah. when he'd moved into the Dakota and his son, Sean, had been born. Yeah. He said, I'm just staying at home baking bread. Do you think that was the euphemism? <laughs> do you need a paramedic or something? No. Or how about a fire extinguisher? No, a fire extinguisher I could do with. Uh, no, I don't think it was, a, it was a euphemism at all. I think yeah. that's exactly what he did. He'd, he'd sort of withdrawn from life. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, George Michael very, very sadly whose demise, you know, we've recorded uh, on our shows um, since the, the tragedy of it happening on, on uh, Christmas Day. But yeah. now there are questions being asked about, you know, what really happened to George Michael and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, jo- John Lennon went into the same sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, reclusiveness, right? Yeah. Oh, no, George Michael wasn't a recluse. Oh, he was. No, he wasn't. Of course he was. No, just because you didn't see him didn't mean he was a recluse. No, a recluse the story is somebody the doesn't go out. Well, I, I read a story the other day about, um, and, you know, there's been a lot of stories around about George Michael. He went to a local um, cafe, yeah. uh, quite a upmarket one in, uh-huh. in Goring, was it, in Oxfordshire? Well, he had a house there, Yeah, yeah. And there was a chap there, he got talking to him, said, you're George Michael. And he mm. said, yeah, I am, actually. Yeah, he said, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm big and mild yours. OK, do you want to come back and listen to some of my records? Yeah. And they went back to his house and they sung Careless Whisper with him. Yeah. He said, in this huge well, what's house... What's wrong with that? Reclus- reclusives don't do that, do they? No, no, no. In this huge house, there wasn't one single... 
person, like you know, a maid or right. or a, a chauffeur or well, a bit like your place or a butler or a guy well, who looks you after live on the your house. Own. You don't think that's weird? Do you? Yeah, but I haven't got a thirteen yet. I haven't got a thirteen bedroom country mansion to retire to. You know what I mean? Why not? Well, I'm still looking. And um, and 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 this guy said he he, he was clearly a very lonely man. Uh-huh. Now Len sort of went down that route that, but then came back, but. His famous quote was, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, baking bread, because he says it's a, it was a great thing to do, very therapeutic. Well, it is very therapeutic. So maybe it's something you should take up, considering you're always boasting really about having worked in yeah, a bakery. Yeah. Unlike you, I'm not trying to fill my days with, uh, you know, doing meaningless tasks. I'm no, quite busy, right. actually. I've got lots going on. Uh, Forley says this, you can sense Porky's jealousy that because the Titanic theory was not his, uh, he's being all petulant a la pep no, on Match of the Day. I'm not. It and, just doesn't uh, stack Gabrielle up. Gabrielle says, shouldn't Porky be expert on sinking ships? After all, he supported Everton his whole life, and it Ooh, today. I don't know. Has Hashtag gibberish. Uh, uh, well, no, not at all. Now, I've got, sorry, very exciting, I a, a got a very exciting hour coming up. We've got Michael Van Gerwen coming on yep. uh, to talk about his win last night yep. in the World Darts. And, of course, his Ask Porky as well. Forty says, worried about Porky's health mm. with his BMI for a 62-year-old man having him down as overweight. No, no, no. Can no. Porky go one show without mentioning John Lennon, says Ryan. Well, uh, I only mentioned it because it was relevant to what we were talking oh, about. So. You know, I don't oh. uh, sort of gratuitously come on every day and say, oh, mm. I must mention John Lennon. No, you know? it's such that happens by accident. Forty says, mm. you will need to disinfect the studio, particularly the microphone, due to Porky's cold. No. It's selfish of him to come in and spread his germs. No, please understand, please understand that uh, I'm afraid an awful lot of people have got this uh, sort of complaint at the moment yeah. and that I am very, very, very particular well, the Queen, in making in fact. sure I do not uh, in any way impregnate any of the equipment in this yeah. building. In fact, the Queen is suffering from a similar um, well, she is. Uh, problem. She she's not go. been seen for yeah. 23 yeah. days or something like that. Yeah. Hopefully she's going to be all right. That's right. Let's talk to Chris Watham now because, of yeah. course, Swansea's Crystal Palace uh, down at Selhurst Park. Massive game coming up. Uh, it's a six-pointer, really, uh, for either one. If Crystal Palace win, and they can move themselves, edge themselves away from mm. the relegation zone. Uh, if Swansea win, it will be a massive boost for them. Yeah. Uh, Chris, a very good afternoon to you. And uh, is this going to make any difference, the appointment of Paul Clement? Good afternoon, Happy New Year, Jim. Yeah, Happy New Year to you. Yes, thank you. I mean, obviously everyone hopes that they'll have a short-term impact, that that manager, manager bounce that Bob Bradley never really enjoyed. Um, but it does seem as if Swansea are pressing the reset button a little bit, trying to go back to the kind of managerial appointments that they became quite renowned for and have brought them a lot of success originally in the Premier League. Well, are, um, are we sure about that, Chris? Because, with the greatest respect, Mr Clement doesn't have a huge track record of success. And I was going to ask you, what is the criteria for the, the current board of Swansea? What is the criteria for them to appoint a manager? Does he have to have a record of success? Or are they so, you know, amazed by their own brilliance that they can spot a man who nobody else can? Well, Brendan Rodgers being sacked by Reading when he came out of nowhere. Yeah, but it's not the it same board, is it? Well, it is pretty much. There is the same. It's not the same decision-maker owners at the top. Who Jenkins? No, there's no there's different owners, of course. But mm. if you find this appointment, unlike the Bradley one, has had the influence of the supporters' trust with saying a 21 percent holding in the club, they come up and back. Okay. Clement and said it is more like a Swansea appointment. Now, mm. staying that whether Clement will be the right man, only time will tell. And that's the same with any appointment you go for, whether they're right. hugely experienced. Or not, but mm-hmm. you have to say the way Clement operates mm-hmm. is, fits what used to be the Swansea model. And one thing that is quite interesting is that they actually looked at Clement, first started looking at Clement about four years ago. Mm-hmm. So it shows that he is, he does fill those criteria. Yeah. Was Swansea he not? Was he not? Was at. he not also offered the job before uh, Bobcat Bob was offered it? Actually, just be, you know, just before he took it. And and yeah, he's been associated with with Chelsea, with Real Madrid, with Bayern Munich, but he's never actually been. Right at the coal face, if you like, of, of Premier League manager uh, managers' jobs. No, he had a spell at Derby that um, didn't work out. Um, you can take different people's views on why that was. They weren't a million miles away from promotion, and yet they had gone through a bad run at the time. So it is, it's all on Clement to prove himself. And um, you have to say, you must be desperate to do so, because he's given up what seems a, a rather nice little number at Bayern Munich. Yeah. Um, for life at the bottom of the Premier League with, you have to say, if they lose tonight, it's pretty mm. much the last hope gone. they would be seven points of drift. Well, this is this is what I was going to say to you, Chris. My next question is, are, um, are the club now preparing for life in the Championship or is this, you know, a desperate last throw that they can pull something out of the bag and, and retain their status? Because if you look at the track record, and I'm sure you know better than me, most clubs in their position at this time of the season, over halfway through... Don't survive. No, that's right. I think, unless my stats are wrong, only one side has survived 
from having 12 points at the 19 games. Exactly. Enough, that was the West Brom side that Paul's brother Neil played in. That's so right. I'm With sure the, when he gets, Brian Robson, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure when he gets announced, he might uh, he might say it's not over. Mm. That you know they still believe they can do it, but it's a bit of both from Swansea. It's it's not throwing a towel in the say, "Oh, we're definitely going to be in the championship," and this manager is going to get us out of the championship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And neither is it, as you know, some suggested or get someone in with all the experience and a desperate bit, uh, bid to keep you up to, to spend uh, a ridiculous yep. amount of money in January. Because mm-hmm. if it doesn't work out, and there's never ever any guarantees, they'll find themselves in the championship. Possibly looking for another new manager with an even more expensive wage. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because after the game uh, that, uh, that Bob uh, Bradley wasn't in charge of, uh, basically mm. the acting manager said, "Well, clearly we need a lot of new players," because uh, it was obvious that, that whatever Swansea have got, uh, they do not have a motivated team. They do not have a team that looks like they can stay in the Premier League. So if they're going to say, "Well, we're not going to buy anyone," because in the end, you know, we might go down, yep. then that's pretty much giving up, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I think they will buy players. I don't think you know. I don't think there'll suddenly be uh, the, the biggest spenders in the transfer window. That's not been Swansea's way, regardless of new owners or not. They haven't got the, the finances to do that without putting the club at, at risk, and you know that has to be the most important thing. Uh, there will be fans asking for reinvestment of the funds from the sales of the likes of Andreu and Ashley Williams, who has been a huge loss. Mm-hmm. I think there is, there are, there are players. Still good enough at Swansea. They definitely need new, uh, new blood in there. Certainly need a new centre back. But I think one of the things Alan Curtis um, spoke about after the Bournemouth game, and I think he's right, is that the confidence is completely and utterly shot mm. because they, they they play quite well in games for 20 minutes, and as soon as they make a mistake at the back, they concede, and as soon as they concede, you might as well blow up them because you can see the belief draining from the players, and uh, and that had to be the worry tonight if Palace go early on. Forget that we haven't fought that was rest. As uh, Sam Allardyce has talked about, they can pretty much uh, count on those three points. So yeah. that would be a big thing for Clement to address early on, trying to, like I say, press the reset button. And look, if it doesn't work out this season, you have to hope then that the foundations are laid, that Swansea can go back to being Swansea on the same Yeah, and, well, that's and right. Chance of getting back. Kind of do a Newcastle, if you see what I mean. You know, mm. bounce down, but take that season as a rebuilding season, bounce back stronger. Yeah, well, maybe so, yeah. but it's not always yeah. that easy, is no, it? No, it's Chris not. Chris Watham there from uh, Wales Online uh, telling us that Paul Clement is uh, indeed coming mm. in, uh, as mm. we suspected, as we predicted, in fact, but he's going to be at the game, but not in charge of it. I've never quite understood that when you're a manager. Yeah. You get appointed manager, yeah. and you come in, uh, but you're not in charge of the game. Well, Wouldn't Sam you... Allardyce didn't do it, did he? Everybody no. said Sam Allardyce was appointed on yeah. day one, on day two was a game, and yeah. he was in charge. Exactly. And he, he, he went and uh, led from the front. Because I think you should do that. <laughs> well, don't you? I, well, I think you should as well. I remember, remember. Actually, you may or may not remember. There's a guy called Les Reed who was very briefly Charlton manager. In fact, he's one of the shortest-serving managers oh, yeah. in the history of football in no. this country. Yeah. And I was at Charlton on the day he. Oh, um, I'm sure it's Sam Allardyce won game. No, no, it's not sure that. But it, it was literally about sort of twelve games or yeah. something, you know. And he was a coach, and and now he's got a very senior position at Southampton, I think. So mm. he was, he was, you know, he's very highly regarded yeah. as a coach and as a man who could spot, you know, developments in football and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But he. he was, I think it was a bit of an emergency appointment, you mm. know, and he was... And I remember the first game, I, they must have been playing Everton. There's no other reason I would have been at Charlton. And I was sitting next to him because I was, I was in a, um, a seat just behind the director's oh, box. Yeah. And for some unknown reason, he was sitting next to me. Uh-huh. And I bet he was as disappointed as you were. <laughs> well, yeah, he's, uh, and, and I kept thinking to myself, I don't quite understand Was he this. there for the second half? No, he went down to the bench. This is the very point. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so... Um, he done enough for you. I was just sitting there. He was sitting next to me, and, right. I, and I was thinking, "I'm not quite sure why the chairman, of, uh, the, why the manager of Charlton, sitting next yeah. to me." And and then after about twenty minutes, he literally he leapt up like this, and he went to go and sit in the bench. Yeah. But he was so unused to the role of manager right. between director's box and bench, he couldn't find his way down. Right. And some steward had to get hold of him and and say, "Look, it's, right. uh, so he hadn't been like, banished to the to no, the he hadn't been banished. He'd just chosen to start mm. the game, you know, watching it from the, yeah. you know, uh, which by the way, do you remember we had that conversation with yeah. Eddie Jones? Yes, and we we didn't manage to develop the point. No, that, but he said it was sometimes not a good idea to be uh, down on the uh, touchline. Uh, and do you know what? Every time I see a rugby game, yeah. I see all the guys in 
their glass box, yeah. all next to each other, yeah. all able to watch video replays, yeah. all able to discuss everything. Yeah. I believe that's a better way to manage well. during a game than, than we do in this country. Mm. In the old days, there literally was a dugout. Yeah. And the manager's head would literally be at the yeah. level of a I worm. Yeah. Of a worm. And how could you possibly evaluate a game when you're looking at the same level as, as the boot of the players that you're in control of? Well, I thought it was ridiculous. supposed to be near enough to them to make decisions, I suppose. Manchester United's got the, the, the best one because they're at least four or five mm. rows back, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But most of them are still literally on the flat of the ground. And, and as you will know, or probably not... Um, a lot of uh, oh. football. Yes, yes. I just oh, I'd let yeah. you know. Yes. Can you hurry up, please? We need a lot of time. A lot of football. Don't finish at one o'clock. A lot of football pitches yes. camber, right? So even if you're sitting at ground level on one mm. side of the pitch, you can't see the feet or boots really? of your players on the other side of the pitch. That's more than a be- camber. That's be- a hill. No, it's a camber. It's no, a camber. I've really. seen it happen. I've rubbish. seen it happen. Absolutely rubbish. It's not rubbish. It's David says this. Fact. Clement being appointed by Swansea will make no difference whatsoever. They are going down. They and are. He is a championship manager. They well, are. Yeah, yeah. Hard to argue with that, really. They are. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Michael Van Gerwen's coming up a bit later Brilliant. on. Ask Can't Porky wait. as well. Uh, how about this True one from superstar. Uh, Stephen? True now, this, world superstar. This makes a lot of sense. It says Porky doesn't like Les Reed because he took his job at the FA. No, he uh, didn't. And he attaches a, uh, a piece of information in which it says yes. uh, that he was technical director of the Football Association yes. between 2002 and 2004. Right, OK. I'm so when were you through. there? Uh, I was there in the late 90s. So uh, he would have come just after you then? Well, I put the blueprint down and people followed me after that. You know what I mean? When I, did uh, you leave? When did I leave? Yeah. I left in the late 90s. Yes. When you say the late 90s? Yeah, I yeah. mean, what, 98, 99? Well, it was a kind of uh, movable feast. because Were you asked uh, to leave? Uh, uh, no, not at all. But I, was, I managed to combine you know, my return to the heights of journalism with a consultancy role to help the FA because I didn't want to sort of abandon them you know, midway through my project of, uh, of uh, Glasnost. I see. You know. uh, Losty says this, Paul mm. Clement must be mad giving up a cushy gig at Bayern and a trip to Doho. Does he mean Doho for a lightly relaxation with Swansea? Yeah. Too much risk. Yeah. Uh, well, look, uh, the proof is in the pudding. The point is that from speaking to our colleague Chris, mm. who was from the South Wales uh, website, wasn't he? Uh, Wales Online. Wales Online, thank called, you. Yeah. yeah, that's great, yeah. Um, you know, it's almost as if the expectancy factor for Mr Clement is zero. Yeah. I.e., it's all over for this season and you've got to start now looking towards next season oh, doing a Newcastle. Thing. This is the weird thing because, yeah. like I say, I mean, listening to him saying, well, you know, they will make yeah. some purchases, yeah. Yeah. they will buy some players. Yes. But, I mean, there's never that many good players available in the January transfer window. I think Jermaine Defoe was probably mm. the greatest signing made in January well, by Sam Allardyce, right, um, uh, to Sunderland. Didn't Sir Alex sign a couple of real... The surprising players. Well, I'm like, thinking more in terms of places that the people are yeah, saving no, themselves uh, uh, going down. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, yeah. You know, okay, I, mean, yeah. Swansea, no, no. I mean, who are Swansea going to sign realistically to stop them from going down? Who's going to go to a club that almost, you know, looks as though it's destined for, uh, for and, the league And Paul the Clement, as much as he may mm, have mm. some interesting mm. kind of uh, connections with Bayern and yep. Real Madrid and Chelsea, yep. is anyone really going to travel with him there and go, well, because yep. I knew you so well at Bayern Munich, I'm going to come and play for Swansea? Uh, absolutely right. I mean, what I, what I said to our correspondent there, Chris, was, well, you know, who's appointing the managers now, he said, oh, it's gone back to the old days. Well, it hasn't because they've got new owners Mm. and new owners will always uh, have an influence on those who they depute to carry out the club's policies. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, now, one final one on the Titanic. Pork is a sort of selfish individual who would have sneaked onto the lifeboats and uh, with the women and children, says Steptoe. That is outrageous. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Probably if... correct, though. No, no, it's not. I would have gone down with the ship, honest to God. I would have made sure every woman and child on the ship got onto a lifeboat, yeah. that they got away, mm. that they were, uh, you know, almost certain to survive. Yeah. And I literally would have been standing on the... Literally. ...on the foredeck. Saluting, uh, yeah, you know, a, there's a funny the, rhyme about the, that. Isn't it? <laughs> I've got to go I into like that. To do that. Um, saluting the uh, God and the Queen, and mm. I'd have slid down under the icy waters um, uh, with the ship. The thing is that you wouldn't actually drown because apparently the North Atlantic is so cold at yeah. that time of the year. Because of course it was December the twelfth, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah, that yeah. uh, you only you can only survive apparently about three minutes in yeah. water like that before you have a heart attack. Yeah, because your system doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a cheery little story, please, um, isn't it? Yeah, by the way... Well, you know I, a bit more sort of uplifting no, to no. discuss? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I can discuss. Go on. Did you know that uh, a bottle of water these days, because, of course, you're yeah. big into sort of uh, palatial dining and all that kind of what? stuff, aren't you? It's what you waste most of your when money you on. When you say palatial dining, yeah. just because I don't mm. eat fish mm. fingers and, uh, and mushy peas every night mm. does mm. not mean I'm into palatial dining. Well, I quite like eating nice food. Yeah, What's okay. wrong with that? Yeah, no, nothing wrong with what that. What is no. wrong with that? No, nothing wrong with that. You don't waste your money in fancy restaurants and all that. Um, did you know that... What, you mean taking entertainment? people and taking them out do to you, have a nice um, time. Do you ever have uh, water at your table when you're eating? When? 
when you're out in these fancy restaurants. Yeah, I always ask for tap water. Well, that's what I mean, yeah. Cause I I'm always ask for tap yeah, water. Yeah. In fact, funnily enough, on New Year's Day yes. uh, night, yes. I was out with my daughter and her fiancé yeah. in quite a pricey place, and right. they said, would you like some still or sparkly water, mm. as they always do? And I said, I'll just have tap water, thanks. Some people are embarrassed to do that. What's, they that, think what's it their reaction to cheap. it? Nowadays, they always say, fine. Yeah. But they're always trying on. Because yeah. uh, I once paid, I think the most expensive uh, bottle of water mm. I bought was in Robert De Niro's restaurant right. in New York. Yes. Uh, which is called the Tribeca Grill. Yes. I know uh, that. You know it, do you? Yes. You've been there? Uh, probably. It's no, in Tribeca. No, yeah. Oh, well, that's a good guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wonder what street it's on. Mm, it's on. Begins with M, doesn't it? M. M. Hold on. What's, what's, um, the, what's, what's the name of it? No, I'm right, aren't I? No. no. What street is it on? No, now? it doesn't matter what street it's on. What street is it on? I won't tell you. I want what you to tell me on. now because you're trying to make out that I should know this and I don't, and that you do. Oh, do really? you? Yes, I do know. Of course, yeah, I do. On, I've been there loads of times. Tell us. I can't remember. Exactly. Can't uh, remember now listen. I but so how much was that bottle of water? Uh, it was eighteen dollars. Right. Well, there you go. And it was a bottle of Fiji <laughs> water, <laughs> right? But it came in this very sort of elaborate um, presentation sort yes. of box yes. tray type yes. thing, yes. which had ice all around it, uh, and this bottle of Fiji water in the middle, which was made of glass. Right. And it's very nice water. Yeah. But, I mean, even then, mm. I mean, nowadays, I mean, that was probably about 10 years ago. Mm. So 18 bucks for a bottle of water. I thought, this is absolutely Well, let ridiculous. me tell you now, I thought it was all going away. I thought the water industry was going away, like bottled water, and I thought people had seen through it. It's no. not. It is massive. It's now worth two and a half billion pounds a year in this country. And the most expensive uh, bottle of water you can order at your table is twenty. Twenty six pounds. In fact, you can even buy one for twenty six pounds. Twenty six pounds. Yeah, twenty six pounds. Dear God. <laughs> Listen to this. Yeah, go on. Coca Cola. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not dying. Every time you talk, you start coughing, which oh, is yeah. no bad thing. I'm sorry. I'll get this sorted overnight. Don't worry. Go on. Uh, now, Coca Cola, which of course is one of the world's most famous brands, its new water is called Glacio Smart Water. Uh-huh. Okay. That's smart water. Glacio Smart Water. Yeah. Believe it or not, because it's a worldwide corporation, Coca Cola. It comes from a spring in Morpeth in Northumberland. Uh-huh. It's near where I'm going to retire to. Well, you keep saying that. Yeah. And it is vapour distilled. And what that means is it is evaporated and then condensed again. Mm. It's a process Coca-Cola calls being inspired by the clouds. So, so this what... is actually Coca-Cola water? Yeah, Coca-Cola water, so what yeah. Was that, what was that other water they made? Do you remember they, they, made, uh, uh, they made... Was it in a black um, No, thing, no, it wasn't, no. Well, you wouldn't put water in a black bottle. Oh, I thought they did. No, but they made this stuff which was, uh, yeah. which was meant to be natural water, but then they had to kind of re... Um, uh, explain themselves and oh, okay. say, in fact, in fact, technically it was not water, it was something that had gone through some weird process. Well, I don't know, but this is what is so interesting about this is, they, mm. they actually, it's like, um, you know, like we used to do that experiment in the chemistry lab at schools, where you heat the no. water, and it goes to steam, and then yeah. it hits a cold surface, and then it reconfigurates into no. water drops and comes down again. No. Yeah, I always did that. I never yeah, did that. I did that. And it, anyway. What uh, happens? What happens? You do it in a, like a, like a um, test tube, you mean? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that sort of thing. And that's what they do with this water, mm. right? Now then, the point is, Glasso Smart Water is now worth twenty one point nine million pounds, right? Um, and they're going to invest another fifteen million pounds. Are you sure in, this is drinking water? Drinking water. It is. No, why is it called Smart Water? Well, because it's 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 superior drinking water, if you see what I mean. Okay. Yeah. But it's not it's not the only one. It says here it's no longer enough for water to simply be water. Yeah. It has to have special powers. Recent additions include BLK water, which is black water. Black water. Yeah. I don't know. I fancy that. Fat water. Fat water. Which contains quality <laughs> fat. No, right. it contains it contains fat. By the way, Anthony's reminding me that Dasani water is the stuff we're talking about. Well they done. made this stuff called Dasani, which everybody thought was the yep. real thing. And yep. it turned out it was made through this chemical process. It wasn't actually as quite as pure as it was being made out to uh, be. I see, OK. Yeah. And perhaps the most amazing one is deep ocean water. Deep ocean water? Harvested off... The... salt in it? Uh, well, they take the salt out. This is the whole point. All right. So it's harvested off the coast of Hawaii. Harvested? Yeah. What, you mean collected right. in a bottle? Uh, well, I love it's collected, these words. It's collected these... from under under the. It's it's well, water's collected in a bucket. Yeah, but they it? they don't take it from the surface. They take it from way what down. Does it make? No, they take it from way down. What difference does that make? Because they're harvesting the water from underneath the surface. It's pure or better water. No, it's not. It is. No, it it's is. not rubbish. The and sea water anywhere is the same. And what they do is they it, this hydrates you twice as fast as normal water. So if you've had a big night on the source or mm. something and you want to rehydrate, yeah. then if you get some Hawaii harvested water, it's better for you. That's okay? rubbish. No, it is. It is. Why not just harvest it from the English Channel? Because as, they, it, as you call it. Well, because if you think about it, the English Channel has uh, oil tankers and things going around right. it all the time. Whereas oh, yeah. in Hawaii, yeah. where there are no oil tankers... You think there are no oil tankers in the Pacific? The, the water 50 feet down mm. is better water than the water that you no. see on the surface. No. It is. Incorrect. <laughs> anyway, we're out of time now. Do you know that water 50 feet down yeah. 
never reaches the surface. It just moves around That's the world true, 50 either. feet under the surface. That's not true. No, it is true. Absolute rubbish. It is true, rubbish. honestly. Now, we've got Michael Van Gerwen to talk to, so Excellent. he'll be quiet. And Thank we've you. got to ask Porky to do as well. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know I need someone. Help. When I was young, was so much younger than today. That music can only mean one thing. Yep. It is that time of the week when we search yep. uh, for help for all sorts of people, for mm-hmm. all sorts of problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, loads of people have posted their, their uh, problems and their uh, Good. queries Good. on Facebook and Good. on uh, our Twitter account, at the two mics, of course. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to be as brief as you can possibly be, of course. as always, because mm. uh, lots of people want to get their uh, yep. questions answered. The first one uh, comes from Losty. <laughs> Are you going to be all right? Yes, I mean, of course. We've nope. got some medics in here for you. No, no. Uh, the first one comes from Losty. How do I get my Jack Russell puppy to sleep at night? She's keeping me awake, and I'm starting to go crazy like you, Porky. Well, actually, I'm not an expert in uh, putting dogs to sleep. I mean, in the nicest oh, possible way, you know. Uh, but what I would say is I'd take um, advice from a vet, because if the little dog is not sleeping, it's both keeping you uh, awake and annoying you, but also, clearly, the dog's not happy, because it's going to be irritable during the day. So what I would do is one of two things. Either... Give it the liquid cosh, which you give to children. It's called Calpon. That would uh, keep Cal-Pol, it quiet. Calpol, actually. Eh? Calpol. Calpol, or seek um, uh, uh, advice from a, a vet. All right, here's one from uh, 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 somebody who calls himself um, uh, T- TMU yeah. uh, on Twitter. I'm due a phone upgrade. Would you recommend an iPhone 7 or the Galaxy S7? And what is each one's pros and cons? Uh, do you know what? I think phones are boring because uh, what you really need with the phone is you need a phone to be able to work. So you talk into it, you text on it, you take emails for business and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, that's all I need of a phone. I don't play games on it. I don't know why people do. I see these morons sitting on trains and wasting their time way playing games on the phone when they could be acquiring knowledge what i would say is get the most efficient phone that enables you to communicate with others and the world and make your own choice now here's one about uh, everton which says uh, would everton be better off cashing in on lukaku to strengthen the squad and make them better overall uh, that's a decision for mr kuman i would never de- uh, deign to try and second guess mr kuman or the methods or what he does however i do like lukaku a lot, and I hope that he stays at the club and that other great players come and join him. Mark says this on Facebook. Hey, Porky, I've had a bit of a sense of humour short circuit about your recent comments on Hull. How yes. do I put my life back in order and see the funny side of things? Uh, well, what you do is, mate, just go to the two mics.co.uk, uh, that's our website, and go back about 10 or 20 podcasts, listen to three at a time whilst taking strong, bladderating drink, <laughs> and you will be fine. Uh, not, of course, that we recommend the misuse of alcohol. No. Uh, Connor says this. Would Porky ever consider appearing on Celebrity Mastermind? And if so, what would be his specialist subject. Uh, well, I dread to think what the answer is to this. Well, one. Uh, uh, when I watch Mastermind, I normally get about half the questions right on the specialised subject, but three quarters of the questions right on the general knowledge uh, subject. So, uh, providing you know, I took a subject of which I am very familiar, I would do very well indeed. Um, I don't want to bore anybody to death with what my special subject would be, but I would probably choose the Beatles. Yeah, you got uh, three out of ten on that when the quiz no. here, I think it was. Uh, that's because the questions were gerrymandered. The mastermind uh, question masters are, in fact, uh, neutral and very, sure? and very efficient. Are yes. you sure? It's not John Humphreys that does them. Uh, no, definitely not John Humphreys. Here's one from Rich. Work dictates I need to spend some time in London over the mm. next few weeks. Mm. What is there to do in Bloomsbury? Is the question. In Bloomsbury, there used to be a load of people called the Bloomsbury set, right? And what they did is they went around painting sort of weird paintings and that sort of stuff and then sticking them in art galleries and writing a few books and poems and all that. Basically a waste of space and a waste of time, but they like to call themselves the Bloomsbury set because it made them feel special. Uh, I know Bloomsbury well. There's a couple of nice hotels there. There's wine bars. Uh, there are restaurants, there's a place where you can walk around on the green, Bloomsbury Square, and it's not very far from Euston Station. Get there quick. Uh, Here's one from uh, Richard. Why do you drive at 10 miles an hour over the speed limit on motorways, but 10 miles an hour under the speed limit on dual carriageways? Well, you can go, like, 60 miles an hour legally on a dual carriageway, Mm. unless it's designated 70. Unless you see that uh, white disc with the black stripe across it, yes. it's, you've got to go at 60. Uh-huh. So I don't. I accord to the speed limit on dual carriageways because they're not as safe to drive on as motorways. The speed limit on motorways should be raised immediately in this country to at least 80 miles an hour. Now, uh, as this is Bring Back Tuesday, says yes. John, have you had to take any of your Christmas presents back this year? No, I haven't taken any Christmas presents back, but unfortunately I had a situation where somebody bought me a jacket and it was tailored, a tailored jacket, and uh, the first time... When you I you say put- a tailored jacket? Yeah, tailored. Mean? 
Yeah. What do you mean, a tailored jacket? I, I mean, made to measure jacket. Okay? Made to measure? Yes, made to measure. Yes, OK. Right. And uh, unfortunately, when I put it on the first time, the right sleeve has gone uh, gammy-like. Uh, it's all... Uh, so it wasn't made to measure, then? It was made to measure, but somebody's, somebody's done something wrong with the sleeve, so I'm going to have to take it back and get a new one. Uh, I don't mean a new sleeve, I mean a new jacket, because it's just not good enough. Right. I, won't, I won't to tolerate it. OK, here's yeah. one from John. Uh, I'm trying to do dry January. So far, I've failed miserably by getting sidetracked on a coastal walk around Whitley Bay and ending up on the Blood Ration Trail. Any tips on staying on the wagon for the rest of the month? No, I wouldn't bother trying. I think I think these people who go off the drink all of January are the biggest bunch of bores in the world. Uh, you know, oh, you know, go look at me, you know, dry January and all that. Christmas in itself is OK. New Year's good. But it's a total letdown January sometimes after the festivities and made worse if you'd suddenly deprive yourself of drink. I've got no problem whatsoever with you taking a month off drink, but it should never be January. May mate of mine I went to see up in the north when I watched Everton recently took a month off in November before the festivities. I think that's far more sensible. Mark, a Newcastle fan, says, please help me, Mike. I'm a Bolton fan who yeah. just loves football and who has an opinion. Should I just close the curtains and hide? Uh, well, you could find a, a dark room and lie down with a wet towel on your head or something like that because it can't be much fun being a Bolton fan. Uh, it's good to be growing up and uh, living in the north of England. But frankly, uh, football cyclical. You had some good years under Big Sam and uh, better times will come. Uh, Porky, I was thinking of throwing a sickie at work this week after having 12 days off at Christmas. Uh, am I taking the mickey or what? You're definitely taking the mickey. He has 12 days off at Christmas. For well, goodness lots of people sake. did this year. Well, uh, if you did, that's fine. Uh, old MG and I had two days off. Of Christmas, that was Christmas and Boxing Day. Yeah, well, I mean, over the Christmas New Year period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, about. yeah but we, uh, you know, I think we worked for 20 days around that. That's what we like doing. We like contributing to society. We like serving our customers. We like providing the service I'm that those people need. Uh, I'm speaking for myself. I assume that as you were alongside me most of the work I did. You wanted to be there as well. Next question, please. Yeah, not entirely, actually. Uh, Adam says this Hello, Porky. I just had a great Christmas, but I'm now back to reality. I don't want to join the gym, but I put some weight on. Shall I go back to the gym or not. I'm quite comfy the way I am. Well, I find gyms quite boring because uh, I think when you're doing something so repetitive as running on a treadmill or something like that or pulling these uh, daft levers that people pull or stepping up and down and all that, that can get intensely uninteresting. I would start walking. Honestly, it's the very, very, very best and therapeutic uh, physical exercise you can take. Walk anywhere, anytime, uh -huh. urban, country, uh, whatever Even though you want. we had that cardiologist on the other day who said actually walking, unless you're uh, very, yeah. very young, yes. is not of any benefit whatsoever. Well, that may be his opinion, but mentally well, he's for a me it's very good. Yeah, well, OK, well, then maybe he's one kind of cardiologist. I know cardiologists who say it's very good for you. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Chris says this, it's my 22nd birthday, Porky. What one thing should I uh, ask for or need at this age to have an empire like yours? Well, I don't have an empire. I have some wise investments which I've made since uh, your sort of age, actually. At 22, what you want to do is look around and say this. One night a week, instead of going out with your mates every night and getting bladderated, which is what I used to do, I would find something else to do, like, for instance, work and earn some money and invest that money. And another mate of mine went one night a week to night school to study to be an accountant and became an accountant and became a wealthy man as a result. Do that. Take the initiative. Break away from the pack. Grant says this. Porky, something needs to be done about Mike Dean. What do you suggest? Uh, he actually asked a slightly different question. No, I'm not yeah. reading that one out. Yeah, well, there's a lot of pressure on Mike Dean this morning. At 48 years of age, he's been said to be too old by, amongst others, Tony Cascarino, yeah. uh, our colleague here at uh, Talk Sport. However, I do think he's been a great football servant. And so if I were at the FA, I would definitely sit down with experts and have a chat about it. Definitely. Um, OK. Uh, Pete says, well, um, what would you rather go through, uh, being hit in the face by a heavy steel door or do the cinnamon challenge again? Uh, I wouldn't do the cinnamon challenge again. It might kill me. It mm. was a shocking experience. I couldn't possibly do it again because... It, you must have felt awful for weeks after that. Uh, I did. It, it, it's too frightening. However, I would never wish to be smashed in the face with a heavy metal door, but fortunately, Sandy, who is the uh, the heavy door hitter, um, <laughs> has... Uh, heavy door specialist. Yes, that's right, has gone home today, so there won't be any danger of that happening. I, I'm smart than the average bear and trying to keep away from all those things. Oh, OK. Uh, here's one from... Um, uh, where is it? Craig, if I dress like you in Pierre Cardin in first class, how many times will I get asked for my ticket? 
Uh, well, every time the guy comes through, but I've never, ever been upbraided about having the wrong ticket anywhere I've sat on a train, a plane or a boat mm. or anything like that. So as long as you're honest to yourself and to the world, you ain't got a problem. Uh, Ragnar says this, if you could go for a meal on expenses, of course, uh, with three famous world leaders from history, who would they be? Uh, I expect a lineup of vicious dictators, but I'm sure you'll surprise me, Porky. No, not really at all. You'd have to include Winston Churchill. It'd be great to see Alexander the Great. And, uh, great to see Alexander the Great. Great to see Alexander the Great. <laughs> and, and then possibly... Great to see you, Alexander Possibly, the great. you know, um, if it had to be a world leader, then it'd have to be the Duke of Wellington, because he's the only one of our great military men who became Prime Minister. Uh, OK. Uh, here's one from a guy uh, who's on his own up north. He says, my wife is in London on the lash today, uh, so I'm home alone. Should I go on the lash? Uh, no, but uh, don't let Mike Graham know where your wife is because uh, he might go on the lash uh, with her because That's he's that harsh. sort of guy. Well, he's very sociable towards our listeners. Yeah. Uh, what I would do is, mate, yeah, I would get out on the lash yourself, definitely, because for one reason is, if your wife comes home and she's been lashing up all day, uh, the conversation tonight will be absurd. She will be bladderated, you will not, and that always makes for an uncomfortable conversation. Uh, Matthew's asking a question that uh, you uh, posed a little bit earlier on the, with the waterfront, right? Mm-hmm. How do you keep the bucket empty to pick up and bring the special pure water from the bottom of the ocean without it mixing with the water from the uh, top of the ocean? Well, that's the easiest scientific question I've ever been told. You, you, have, a, you have a huge box, which yeah. is um, full box. of compressed air, yes, yeah. and what you do is you take it down to 70 feet below the water, uh-huh. you expel all the air and take water in from that level. Right. That fills the, uh, it up and then it floats to the surface uh-huh. and then you work on it as the purest water in the world. What, so a box full of air, yeah. which is at the bottom of the ocean, yeah. uh, once you fill it with water, then floats to the surface. Exactly. Are you sure about that? I'm certain, absolutely certain. Wouldn't it more likely float to the surface if you took the water out? No, of course not. No, 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 it would, honestly. Believe me, I know so these things. if you filled a box full of water yes. and threw it into a, a yes. lake, it would float, would it? No, no, of course it wouldn't. But if it was on the, uh, it was on the bottom well, of the lake... How does this come up, then? Uh, listen, we haven't got time for this. No, more questions, please. Come on, this is a, a, uh, no, a rapid final, fire one. final one is actually uh, more important. Uh, it says, and this is from Wheelie, mm. it says, please tell the two mites not to advise giving cowpaw to a puppy. Paracetamol is dangerous to dogs, so yeah. don't do that. Yeah, I absolutely endorse that. It was meant as a joke. I called it the liquid cosh, and I didn't really want to say what it was, but you're absolutely right. Do mm. not give anything human, including chocolate or human food, to dogs, please. We protect our dogs because we love them. That was Ask Porky. Now, coming up from 1 o'clock, Hawksby and Jacobs are here. Uh, over in our sister stations, you can hear John Holmes on Talk Radio and Kate Lawler on Virgin. Don't forget, over on Talk Sport 2 from 8pm tomorrow night, and we bring you live commentary of the Copa del Rey, last 16 first leg clash mm. between Real Madrid and Sevilla. I wonder if Pep Guardiola will be watching that and I wishing he was still back yeah. in uh, uh, the, the old motherland. It's a bit cruel, that. Bit what do you cruel. mean? Well, you know, you should, um, you must ask questions about the boy. He's just I'm going through a bit of a difficult he's time. He's going through questions about a difficult time. Well, he's yeah. going through a difficult yeah. time, yes. and he doesn't like answering questions about it. I mean, we'll see, yeah. I suppose, in the yeah. fullness of time. Because uh, it's Manchester Derby soon, isn't it? It certainly is, yeah. And yeah. I mean, uh, if, uh, if City were to lose to United, I suppose that's the other thing. I mean, mm. he must look at Jose Mourinho and wonder how he manages to deal with all of this horrible uh, journalistic or, nonsense that or, goes or, on in Britain, right? Or how he kept it all together. Yeah. Yeah, he's absolutely right, yeah. How, how did Jose manage to, uh, you know, not snap like yeah. I've done? I mean, Jose's been a little bit edgy on times, but he's never done that, yeah, has but he? but he's never done that. No. Now, listen, uh, you're going to keep quiet now because yeah. we've got a, a, a star of uh, the world of sport coming on, Michael Excellent. Van Gerwen. Uh, beat Gary Anderson to win the P- did. PDC World Darts Championship uh, incredibly yeah. uh, in a match that contained 42 180. Unbelievable. Uh, let's talk to Michael now. Michael, a uh, very good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Congratulations. Good afternoon, guys. Mm, thank, thank you very you. much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, uh, it's ter- a terrific victory there. Michael, you've had so much success this year, and I don't want to in any way question your brilliance of what you do, but do you wish you had more than two uh, World Darts Championships? Of course, I, I wish I had uh, five, but oh. I have two at the moment, so I'm happy about this one, and uh, there's more to come, I hope, in the future. And, uh, first, I need to make sure I uh, celebrate this one, because this was a really difficult one, and uh, everyone uh, played absolutely fantastic and, uh, yeah. fantastic against me. I had to absolutely perform my best to win yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah and, was... and of course, you're only 27, sorry, Mike, so yeah. you've got plenty t- of time, Michael, to add to that number. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's, that's correct, but... Uh, I, I, I'm never going to get the 16 of, uh, of Phil Taylor. That's one thing for sure, mm-hmm. because I'll probably uh, retire earlier. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You know, it's, it's no, like... I'm, I'm just... Yes. I, it's been an absolutely phenomenal year for me before this World Championship. I, I won 25 tournaments, 
uh, after, of course, my last year's defeat against Raymond and Barneveld the year before. I lost to Gary Anderson, and this year I beat them in the semi-final and right. final. Yeah. How nice is that? And yeah. how big is Brilliant. darts now? Because uh, I understand you had a phone call from the Dutch Prime Minister uh, yeah. after you won last night, congratulating you and, and, and making you into a sort of national hero. Yeah, they they, uh, they had a quite a yeah they had a lot of views last night on television. Two point eight million, so that's about thirty forty percent of the population was watching. Mm. Uh, of the who, who were watching at that moment television, and to have a phone call for so, from someone like him with this, uh, with, yeah, from a big guy like him because he, he's yeah, it's not like uh, the neighbour is ringing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. like getting it's not like getting a phone call from Mike Parry, is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, Michael. I mean, I know you're a very modest man, but when you go home after winning such a big tournament after such a successful year, you will be yeah. fated as 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 a great um, countryman, won't you? Because you've brought so much pride to your uh, to your nation. Uh, of course, and the, the, I, I'm a proud Dutchman. I love what I do, and mm. I hope I can make everyone happy. That's why they're all watching, and uh, yeah. and also the people in uh, in the UK and all over the world. I, I try to end and entertain everyone and uh, mm. uh, yeah I'm not doing too bad You're and the, atmos- well. the atmosphere as well um, at the Alley Sensational. Pally uh, was just incredible wasn't it over the, yeah, over it the course the was... of the tournament does that does that help you when it's like that or, or I mean how does it affect I, I you when it. you're playing I, I love it when people or if they cheer me or boo me I don't mind I just like to do the thing where I'm good in and I play arts and uh, sometimes it even motivates motivate me if they cheer on like the country the the, 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 the local hero yeah. or wherever do you know what I mean? Right. It's yeah. like it's like that. That that's us. People have always someone they support, and sometimes it's against us. Sometimes it's for, for you, and this makes me stronger. And uh, the level at this moment in this World Championship was absolutely incredible. Everyone played so good, and mm. uh, I'm, I'm really happy. I, I've I've won this one. Sure, um, Michael Phil Taylor during the course of the tournament did make a complaint that some of his opponents were using mind games. You know, they were chattering, they were Ooh. talking to him. How do you get over that sort of thing? Because you must get that as well. Of course, everyone gets uh, yeah used to mind games, but it's, it's a re- but then if you if you get bothered by that, then your mind is not strong enough. Mm. <laughs> Simple as that. Right. That's how I think. That's why I think of it. Uh, you know what I mean? People mm. can say whatever they sure. want, but it's not, it's not really bothering me anyway, because mm. I need to do the right thing anyway, and I've got nothing to do with anyone, and I just want to... I'm a, I'm, if someone watch my game, I'm always a fair player, and mm. I always do my thing, and, uh, and same as Gary, by the way, and all the other guys who have played, and mm. we... The best man won this week and uh, maybe this year, and I, I'm really glad that that's me. Yeah. And you and you've been playing darts really since a very very young age, since you was about 13. I mean, what happens after winning uh, a tournament? 11, 12, yeah. Uh, 11, 11, winning 12. a tournament like this, I mean, do you take some time out, or do you have to always just keep throwing those uh, arrows to make sure you stay on form? Um, yeah, most of the time if I go on holiday Sunday and then I don't bring my dance, don't worry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I take my time off because you need your recharge batteries because we're going to have a really busy season again and I, I need to make sure I'm ready for that straight away and uh, you, you don't have time uh, uh, yeah, to lose focus or whatever, but sometimes you need to have... Uh, you need to cool down a bit. Mm, that's right. Uh, Michael, without doubt, the game of darts is going to expand during the rest of your career. You're only 27 now. In 10 years' time, you might be playing half your tournaments in China. I mean, what, what, to what extent... Ex- we, we already played in China. Sure, but I mean, you might be playing half of them in China in 10 years' time because... Yeah, the... yeah I, hope, I hope so. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> they, yeah. Need, they, they need someone from a really good Chinese. They need to keep practising. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, you can go there and do it for them. And, I, I, and yeah, I'm sure I, you'll be... I'm going to teach them. Exactly. You'll be as popular there as you are here. But quite, quite seriously, Michael, when you've achieved what you've achieved, what keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? Winning. I love winning. I love what I do. I yeah. love playing darts. That's what I live for. And, uh, yeah, of course, I've got a lot of great people around me, like my wife, good friends and family. Mm. And uh, they always support me if it goes well and if it doesn't go well. And that's really important as well. Now, there's a great connection with Holland in this country with the football. I don't know whether yeah. you have an opportunity to watch much of it or to go to any of the games. I mean, you've got Ronald Koeman managing Everton. Right. You had Lou Van Hal, of course, managing Manchester United. You've got loads and loads of Dutch yeah, there's players. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Dutch people at the moment yeah. in the Premier League. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't really have a favourite in the Premier League, but I'm a PSV fan, so... Uh, 
that's the team I support. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, you you haven't had uh, sort of loads and loads of, uh, of, of of Dutch footballers coming to hang out with you or anything like that. Yeah, uh, we I had a couple of Dutch people that come out, did come and watch me, and uh, we went for some food. So, uh, mm-hmm. and you never know, maybe he plays next year in the Premier League. <laughs> that, that's right, Michael. Just like um, snooker players usually have a table at home. Have you got a darts room at home? Have you got the? Uh, I didn't have to, but I'm building a new house, so I might have some space for a new dart board there. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're if you're having it built yourself, remind the architect yeah. to put you know a darts board up and, in the back room. And is it, I yeah. mean, I know you said you said you're not going to take uh, your darts on holiday with you. I mean. I, I don't know where you. I don't want you to tell us where you're going either, because you want some peace and quiet. But oh, yeah, is, no, is, is, there, is there a South part? Africa, it's think, a bit far from uh, England. South yeah. Africa is a lovely place. Do you think yeah. there's a part of the world though, where you're not well, they're not that well known, where somebody might challenge you to a, to a game of darts without knowing who you are? Yeah, I did that in the in the in the past when I was a Spain or something. But them days are gone. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. I never go to the pub <laughs> anyway because I rather go to a nice restaurant or. Uh, we're chilling out with my wife or something yeah. like that. So what, if if you got challenged to a game, you used to do it and then just have some fun? Uh, yeah, you never know. Uh, it depends what kind of mood I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And it depends what kind of mood the other person's yeah. in as well, doesn't it? Yeah, they can get a how bit... much he wants to lose. Exactly. <laughs> so when are we going to see you again on the television, uh, Michael? What, what's the next uh, uh, tournament? I'm playing uh, the Masters at the end of January. That's the first one. Mm-hmm. And I got like a... Uh, a celebrity AM in Germany this uh, Saturday okay. uh, with a couple of uh, famous people, and uh, it, that's going to be fun as well. Great oh, stuff. Sounds great. Well, yeah. terrific stuff. Congratulations, and, and, and many more thank wins, perhaps, much, I'm sure, are going to come yep. your way. Michael, thank you very much thank indeed. You Michael very much Van indeed for joining us. What a great guy. Smashing and a guy. tremendous Smashing attitude guy. about winning as well. Yes. Yeah. Not interested in uh, in gamesmanship, doesn't no, care, no. knows that uh, if he wants to win something, he has to win it on his own. That's well, a great quote. I'll I, tell you what, he, he, could, he could teach Pep Guardiola a thing or two. He, he? he certainly could. When I said, how would you get over the, basically, the sledging, you yeah. know, that uh, I was yeah, talking he about. Care. He said, not he, not strong he, enough. He said, your mind's not strong enough if yeah. you get affected by that. Yeah. And of I course, thought you were going to ask him about the about Apple thing. No, nah, I, did, I didn't want to Why bore not? him with that. Well, because he's probably had a lot of... It was a, it was a sponsored thing, and it was oh, a betting company who... I don't think it ever happened, it, did it? It did, honestly. He's making it up, aren't he? I'll tell you where the darts club was. It's on Lower Thames Street, where the current headquarters of the Daily Express is, right? Oh, yeah. Right next door, there's uh-huh. a cellar. A darts club. A uh, darts club, yeah. There, there used is. to be a, a wine bar there. Uh, I'm well, sure it wasn't a wine bar. I think it is that one. I think it is, honestly. And uh, and the idea was, I had to go along, I had to put an apple on my head, Michael Van Gogh was going to throw a yeah. dart well, at the apple and take it off it my head, didn't remember, William didn't. Tell style. Yeah. And then at the last moment, a combination of insurers and, and uh, health and safety oh, yeah. people said it couldn't really be like done. Bournemouth Pier stuff all over again. Well, I wanted to jump off Bournemouth Pier, mate, but they wouldn't yeah. let me, would yeah, they? Yeah, of course. Mm. I would have pushed you over. Uh, this is Two Mics on Talk Sport with Wix, and every day we give away a £100 Wix gift card to the best caller of the day. Today's winner is Chris the Bolton fan. Very well. Uh, who came on to discuss Pep Guardiola and ended up getting shouted at by Porky for daring to have an opinion. Yeah, well, shocking. You know.